This is Audible. Audible Frontiers presents Bleak Seasons, written by Glenn Cook and narrated by Jonathan Davis. Chapter 51 Of course I got lost. It was inevitable. The future me within me didn't recall anything else, but it did remember that I was going to get lost, then find my way to some place I wasn't trying to go. That much came to me just after I realized that I didn't have a clue how to get back to any familiar part of the palace. I stopped to take stock. At that moment, I had enough near-current memories of other Murgans from other times that I was ready to trust any memory from any time, though it came with no supporting context whatsoever. This memory of getting lost carried flavors of the excitement of unexpected discovery and powerful overtones of pain. An echo told me I didn't want to find my way again. Somewhere, while still stubbornly trying to get out, I came upon a gloomy hallway that seemed to smell of old magic. A few yards away, a shattered door hung precariously upon a single hinge. Discovery beckoned. I went forward unafraid. One look inside told me I had found Smoke's secret library the place where the only surviving copies of the first several annals had been gathered and sealed away, so there would be no chance we black company types would ever chance upon them. I wanted to read them so badly. But I hadn't come to read. I didn't have time to sort the wheat from the chaff of a hundred other books. I had to get back to my family. I strove valiantly but couldn't get there. Head spinning, I tried to retrace my steps. It looked like I would have to wait with smoke until one eye or the old man turned up. They could leave me out the easy way and maybe tell me why I didn't want to go, because that part wouldn't come to mind clearly. I got back to smoke easily with no misturns. I had begun to suspect that there were spells webbed into that part of the palace cast so no intruder could find his way around the maze without one eye's blessing. It might be that all paths led to the same destination, or maybe they all led away if you didn't start out with smoke to begin. That wouldn't surprise me, though I had no idea if one eye had the skill and power to manage it, nor would it surprise me to find out that he didn't remember casting the spell in the first place, so had made no provision for me to get around it. The deceiver was wiggling when I returned. My step so soft he didn't sense my presence immediately. He froze when he did. Give that man credit for determination. I settled into the empty chair. I waited. Nobody came. It seemed hours passed, but probably it was just a few long minutes. I got up and tramped around back and forth. I tormented the strangler some, but that just made me feel bad, too. I covered him up and sat down again. I stared at smoke. I thought about the black company and its tribulations. I remembered what smoke could do. Why not? Just to kill time? But where to go? What to see? When? Why not the great enemy again? It was easy this time. Nothing to it. Like closing my eyes and drifting off into a reverie. I didn't go without some reluctance. I was spending way too much time beyond the normal pale against my will. Why add to my confusion by going wandering on my own, too? 
With almost a snap and pop, I found myself adrift outside Fortress Overlook. The mad sorcerer Longshadow stood atop one of his tall towers, amidst reflected light, less than ten feet away. I suffered a mild panic. He was looking right at me. Right through me. Behind him, stance mocking, was that wretch Narayan Singh with Croker's kid, the mortal flesh of Kina, the daughter of night, the one foretold who would bring on the deceiver's year of the skulls, which will end with the awakening of their goddess. Singh never let the child out of his sight. Singh was a dangerous tool, but Long Shadow needed every ally willing to join him. Quite a few folks seemed willing to sign on against the Black Company. A figure emerged from a hatchway apparently dark only because of the intensity of the light surrounding the Mad Wizard. This man was tall, ebony, lithe as a panther. No anger touched me because emotions turned pale in Smoke's domain, although this was Mogapa, the most dangerous of the Shadowlander generals. I suspect Long Shadow appreciated Mogaba less for his abilities than because he could be trusted. Mogaba has nowhere to run. The company stands astride every road to safety. I can't understand why Croker doesn't hate Mogaba. Helly he makes excuses for the man, even feels sorry for him. He takes his feud with Blade much more to heart. Mogaba said, Howler brought news. The storm system no longer works. Long Shadow grunted. I saw. My small shadows remain useful. I recall that I predicted they would catch on quickly. Have you any thoughts on how the woman Senjak could regain her powers, when, by the nature of these things, she ought to be at the mercy of anyone who knows her true name. I had a feeling he really wanted to know how Howler could survive a lady with her powers restored and her old, wicked knowledge intact. Long Shadow viewed the world through a lens of paranoia. I wondered myself about ladies' powers. Croker guessed it had something to do with crossing the equator. That didn't sound plausible. Neither One Eye nor Goblin would hazard a guess. The lady herself refused to discuss it. I had no idea what she believed. Nobody pressed. That wasn't something you did if you wanted to stay friendly with somebody like Lady. She can get real unpleasant if she doesn't like you. No ideas, Mogaba said. It isn't something I understand. There were many things Mogaba didn't understand, including any languages native to that region. He communicated with Long Shadow using his improved but still flawed Taglian. Maybe she changed her name. Could they do that? I realized the remark was Mogava's attempt at a joke, but Long Shadow did mull it over as though it was possible in some subjective fashion. The moment passed. Long Shadow faced Singh. Deceiver, why are you here? What machinations has the Howler involved you in now? Mogaba answered for Narayan. The Black Company jumped them in their holy grove and killed everyone but him and the girl. Your shadow weavers barely had time to call for Howler before they died. Howler found these two, hiding a few miles away and got them out only yards ahead of the pursuit. So, this was only a short while after our raid. 
and here was a surprise. I believed Narayan had gotten warning from the Shadow Master. But he hadn't. So how had he shaken the sleep spell? Mention of the Shadow Weavers rocked Long Shadow. I thought he would fly into one of his famed, foamy-mouthed rages. Those strange little old men were a resource he dared not squander. It took a lifetime to train them. And we've taken care of a bunch of them over the years. Long Shadow sucked in a deep breath, held it, restrained his insanity. My error. I should not have sent them. Have you any idea how our enemies could appear at a time so propitious to their cause? Nobody volunteered the news that we could hover over his shoulder any time the urge hit. Long Shadow observed, This is not good. Each day they develop new resources. Each day ours dwindle. He glared at Singh. What are we getting from these deceivers? Mogaba replied. They spy. Before long, they will undertake selected assassinations. The enemy shows no awareness of that program. If their assassinations succeed, the results will be of more value than anything but a decisive encounter on the battlefield. Mugaba invited comment from Singh with his glance, but Narayan held his tongue. Mugaba said, Unfortunately, the intelligence the deceivers gather grows less reliable with each report. The enemy have enjoyed considerable success in their efforts to eliminate the cult. Still no one else spoke. Mugaba continued, Lady and Croker have become very aggressive against spies. I believe that indicates a major move is imminent. It's winter, Long Shadow said and my enemies are in no hurry. They're content to nibble me to death. This so-called liberator will never be satisfied that he has men and weapons enough. He was right about that. Croker never stopped going after more. The howler joined the group, stifling a scream as he did so. He husked. The enemy labor battalions have completed the paved road linking Taglios and Stormgart. A similar road is almost complete from Stormgart to Shadowlight. Shadowlight lies near the heart of the most populous and prosperous region of the Shadowlands. Shadow Spinner had been overlord there, nominally. The city and its environs still owed allegiance to Longshadow. Yet our soldiers were building a road in the area untroubled. I wondered why. Croker's strategic plan didn't require it. He had no intention of besieging Shadowlight. That would tie up too many men for far too long. Mogaba grumbled. They press us everywhere. No day passes but that we hear of the fall of another town or village. Many places the locals no longer resist at all. And it would be folly to assume that Croker and Lady will respect the season. Long Shadow turned his dread mask toward Mogaba, who flinched. Have you done anything to make it difficult to sustain a major campaign, General. An army must live off the land if it ventures far from home. You can't carry enough food and fodder to sustain it any length of time. Very little. Mogaba didn't show an ounce of contrition. 
I have my orders. And our enemies know what those orders are. What? Now Long Shadow was testy. They expect me to sit still. Mugaba indicated Singh, who nodded agreement reluctantly. Their strategy assumes that I will defend one fixed point. Because your orders constrain me to do just that, they scatter their forces and attack everywhere. Blade cannot blunt their sword alone. The villages will not resist because the people know no help will come. I could defeat the fools in detail, in a short while, if our strategy changed suddenly. I don't think so, I thought, floating there smug in the knowledge that we had smoke. Now! Long Shadow forced his quaking flesh to face southward. He glared at the plain of glittering stone. We will discuss military matters in private only, General. Howler delivered a horrible scream edged with mockery. Singh practically dove through the hatchway. His contempt for the Shadow Master was obvious to everyone but Long Shadow himself, though it was likely Long Shadow wouldn't have cared. To the Shadow Master, the Strangler was little more than a useful termite. In his mind, none of us were much more than pesky insects. The child left last. She considered Long Shadow coldly. Her eyes seemed as old and wicked as time itself. She was a scary little thing for sure. I wondered what the old man thought when he saw her, or if he even dared look. Long Shadow said, They don't think I know what I'm doing. My soldiers are wasted where they are, Mugaba replied. They are losing what edge they had. You may be right, but to attack in any direction, you will have to leave what protection I am able to afford you. Without my lost comrades, I cannot reach nearly as far as once I did. Will you risk their sorcery without mine to support you? Mogaba grunted. He glared at the glittering plain. You believe I am a coward for fearing that, General? I stipulate the danger. I grant the value of your protection. But there is much that I could do anyway. Blade has been allowed to act on a limited scale and has accomplished great things. For certain, he has demonstrated repeatedly how these Taglians will collapse if you attack their weaknesses. You trust Blade. More than most. Like me, he has nowhere else to run. But I trust no one completely. Our allies least of all. Neither Howler nor the Deceiver joined us out of love for our cause. Indeed. Apparently amused, Long Shadow seemed to relax. I must explain, General. Mugaba's surprise told me that this was an extraordinary eventuality. I do not stay bottled up here because of the plane. I can leave Overlook for short periods. I will, if I must. The Shadow Gate wards are fresh and strong and reliable and entirely under my control. But if I do venture out, I will have to do so by stealth. Mugaba grunted again. The reason I stay here is that there are some less obvious players in this game. Mogaba frowned. Sounded like a crock to me, too. 
Howla springs from that clan once known as the Ten Who Were Taken. I know. Storm Shadow matriculated from that slave school as well. Another graduate was Sanjak's sister. They called her Soul Catcher. I believe we've met. Yes. She embarrassed you at Stormguard. Actually, that was Lady that time, wasn't it? Mugaba nodded. I was surprised. Time seemed to have given him the ability to manage his temper. Some years ago, circumstances deceived Howla and I. We took Soulcatcher prisoner under the impression that we had captured her sister. She was masquerading as Senjak at the time, so the mistake was more her fault than ours. She escaped during some confusion that arose later. Although we did not treat her severely, she bears us an unreasonable ill will. She has done us mischief before now and awaits the opportunity to do us major harm. You think if you left Overlook she might invite herself inside and forget to leave the door unlocked? Exactly. Huh. Imagine hijacking that incredible fortress. Mogapa sighed. So whether I like it or not... It will have to be decided on the plain of Charandaprash. Yes. Will you win? Yes. Morgava never did lack confidence. As long as Croker remains the man I knew, scarred by that streak of softness. If he hides behind a hundred masks... His soft streak may be another of those. So this man concerns you despite your desire to discount him. We continue to play to his strengths, not to attack his weaknesses. We allow him time to think, to plan, to maneuver, so he does not need to be subtle. His forces advance everywhere, Along the frontier, the people are more afraid of the Black Company than of you. For pure viciousness, there's nothing to match his war against Singh's kind. The croaker I remember would have taken prisoners. He would have pardoned stranglers willing to abandon their religion. Right, I thought sarcastically. Then I reconsidered... Mogaba might be correct. Croker had been forgiving, once upon a time. Maybe Sen Jack wants the example made. Possibly. She is that hard. But her influence doesn't explain Croker's having spent 7,000 lives trying to get Blade. What? This was news. Blade deserted him. I deserted him. And I was company. Blade was only an adventurer, not a brother. He hasn't come after me that way. With Blade, he's fighting a personal war. The falling out with Blade and Blade's subsequent flight and affection baffled a lot of people, especially his buddies Cordy and Willow. And my name can go to the top of the list. Whispers were that Croker stumbled onto something real going on between Lady and Blade. Whatever. It was certain that he was as obsessive about Blade as he was about Narayan Singh. Lady didn't interfere in Croker's vendetta. Neither did she help. That troubles you. Croker confuses me. In some ways he has become dangerously unpredictable. At the same time he becomes more and more the high priest of the Black Company legend, admitting no other gods before his precious annals. That wasn't true. Croker grew less interested all the time. 
but allow Mugabe's hyperbole. He wanted to sell something. Mugabe continued. I fear he may become so skewed. He'll attack in a way so novel. We won't recognize it until it's too late. As long as he comes, only disaster awaits him. He'll come. But is the overall outcome so certain? I got the feeling both men nurtured major doubts, but each mostly about the other. You circle back upon my constraints. Desist. You fear him? I dread him more than I dread Lady. Lady is straightforward in her enmity. She comes right at you with everything she has. Croker is determined to flim-flam you into looking somewhere else while he sticks a knife in your back. He will come at you with everything he has too, but how will he use it? He is not a man of honor. Mugaba didn't really mean that Croker was dishonorable, but that he was not a gentleman in the sense that meant so much to Mugaba, who could not be considered a cavalier himself anymore. Mugaba continued, He's no longer sane. I do not believe he is sure what he is doing himself. These days he has to face much for which there is no precedent in his annals. Wrong again, Chappie. After 400 years, there is a precedent for everything in the annals somewhere. The trick is knowing how to look. He has limits, General. Of course. Those Taglians are factious and divisive. And that could be his undoing. Politically, we will have no option but to try his luck at Charanda Prash soon, where we will crush him. And if I do, we should consider the possibilities of life unplagued by this disease called the Black Company. Oh, winning one battle will not be enough. If even one of them survives and maintains possession of the lands of passion, new armies will rise against us. Lady proved that. Then you will have the pleasure of crushing them again. Mogaba wanted to argue but elected not to bark into the wind. Once Overlook is complete, you can hair off on any adventure you like with my approval and with my total support. Adventure. I understand you better than you suppose. You were Gearsley's greatest warrior, but you could not prove that to yourself. In the Black Company, you were overshadowed by your captain and Senjak. It was necessary for you to have command in order to demonstrate your scope and genius. When you did have an opportunity, all your efforts were sabotaged and suborned. You came to me because the Black Company would not allow you the opportunity you need. Mugaba nodded. He didn't seem pleased with himself, though, and that surprised me. I had thought him too self-centered to entertain moral doubts. Go. Conquer the world, General. I'll enjoy helping you. But you have to crush the Black Company first. You have to stop the Taglians because you will have nothing if I fall. Will the Strangler be much help? Really? He could be. He talks big about his goddess getting involved, but I won't count on that. 
I've never seen the gods actually take a hand in mortal affairs. Odd. Mogaba's god was Narayan's goddess, more or less. Had Mogaba lost his faith? Maybe Dejigore had scarred him deeply, too. Use them up. Leave none over to turn on us later. In my imagination, the Shadow Master was always this huge, stinking devil incarnate, a colorful lunatic, the magnitude of the worst taken back in the North. But the real Long Shadow was just a mean-spirited old man, blessed with too much power. He told Mogaba, if this becomes the year of the skulls, I want it to be our year, not theirs. Understood. What do you think of the child? Long Shadow grunted uncomfortably. Spooky, right? A thousand years old. Her mother in miniature. Only worse more intense, with a deeper darkness inside. He could be right. The kid definitely looked weird and evil from my ghost's eye view. The Shadow Master mused. We may have to hurry her into the embrace of her goddess. Mogaba shrugged. He turned to go. Anyone else you want to see alone? Howler. Wait. What? Where is the lance of passion? Wherever Kruger is, I imagine. Or the standard bearer. But still that serpent Mergen, I believe. I love you too, Mogava. We must take possession. Might that not be a task for the deceivers? Even destroying the Black Company may not be enough in the long run. And one other thing for the deceivers. Have them find out why Senjak wants all that bamboo. Bamboo? Was there an echo? She has been stripping the Taglian territories for months. Wherever her soldiers go, they loot bamboo. That is curious. I will find out. I followed Mogaba for a moment. Once he was clear of the parapet, he muttered, Bamboo. I have to humor a lunatic. I tried to travel south of Overlook. Smoke went only a short way before he balked. Well, I would find out sooner than I wanted, I supposed. After we settled Long Shadow and Overlook, the plane was next on the list of obstacles blocking our path to Katovar. Chapter 52 I returned to the chamber with Smoke and our stinky pet strangler. I was hungry and thirsty, but also so excited I shook. I hadn't uncovered much of resounding import, but gods, the potential. I drank from the pitcher, cleared my throat, lifted the corner of the cloth covering the prisoner. You in there? Want a drink? Want to tell me? He was asleep. Be that way. So what now? Help hadn't arrived. I gnawed on one of Mother Goda's stones. That eased my hunger. That was all I wanted at the moment. What now? Keep going out until somebody came to reclaim me? See Lady? Look for Goblin? Hunt for Blade? How about finding out where Soulcatcher was hiding? She had to be out there somewhere, though we hadn't stubbed our toes in her lately. No place was free of crows if a member of the company was around. 
Soulcatcher is patient. That's her scariest trait. It was kid in the candy shop time. I decided to look for Soulcatcher. She was the oldest mystery going right now. Smoke jumped right out, but then he stalled. His soul, or ka, or whatever, became more agitated as I grew more insistent. All right! She always was more trouble than I wanted to deal with anyway. Let's find her goofy sister. Lady didn't intimidate Smoke at all. I found her in the citadel at Dejagore, in the conference chamber with four men leaning over a map. The frontier markings on the map lay far south of Dejigore. Earlier boundaries were noted and identified by date. She needed a new map. Her old one was too busy. She had won too many skirmishes. Lady is a beauty, even fresh from the field. She looks way too young for Croker, although she is far older than one eye. One Eye never mastered any youth sorcery. Two of Lady's companions were company men. Gayazli Nar, anxious to show the world that Mogaba and his traitors were mutants. That their like wouldn't be seen again. I didn't buy that. Neither did Lady or the old man. We were confident that Mogaba had left somebody behind. Croker once told me, Watch out for somebody to start pointing fingers. That'll be the traitor. A third man was the Prabrindra Dra, the ruling prince of Taglios. He was about as nondescript for a Taglian as a man could be and still be breathing. He put in the last four years learning the arts of war. He commanded a full division now, the right wing of the field army, Lady and the old man took pains to entangle him deeply in their war machine, so he had a personal stake to maintain there. The last man was the improbable Willow Swan. When I focused on him, Smoke became agitated, which proved to me Smoke's self was partially aware on some plane. He and Swan had gotten on like rats and mice. These days, Swan's the captain of the Royal Guards detachment assigned to Dijigore. Swan wears his corn silk hair longer than Lady does her shoulder-length black hair. Sometimes Willow braids his, but at the moment it was pulled back into a ponytail. Lady's hair was back in a tail, too. Usually she lets it hang free. She did keep it combed and clean when she could. A soldier, by accident... Swan didn't want to be a hero. His guards existed outside the army and functioned mainly as military police. He and they owed their allegiance directly to the prince and his sister. Lady said, Howler has quit attacking outposts. You said he ain't stupid, Swan replied. I got too close when I missed him. That scared him off for good. One of the Nar observed, Our raids must trouble them. They trouble me, I see, and I authorized them. Lady shivered momentarily. They are effective. Beyond a doubt. The prince asked, but would the Liberator approve? Lady's smile revealed glistening white teeth that were almost too perfect. She had mastered the cosmetic sorceries early. He doesn't approve. Definitely. But he won't interfere. I'm the one who is here, and I'm relying on my own experience. The prince asked, Will Long Shadow unleash Mogapa? The Nar brigadiers tensed. Mogaba shamed them greatly. By letting pride and vanity seduce him away from the ancient ideals of the Nar. Not to mention, he was going to be blue-assed hell in a fight. Swan asked, You take any prisoners down there? 
Yes. And what they knew would fit into a thimble with room left for a stork's nest. Nobody responsible down there ever sits around the campfire swapping secrets with the troops. Swan stared at her while her gaze was directed elsewhere. He saw a woman five and a half feet tall, blue-eyed, 110 perfectly arranged pounds. She was big for this part of the world. She looked like she might turn 20 soon. That old black magic. Swan was transparent. Lady is cold and hard and committed and deadlier than a sword with a will of its own, but these guys just can't seem to help themselves. It started with the old man way back, but the parade goes on. The fever cost Blade big. Despite what may have happened with Blade, I'm convinced that Lady is the captain's woman absolutely. Whatever happened, Croker took it to heart. He drove a good man over to the enemy and became something as cold as Lady himself. Half the time anymore. Croker is this living war god, so fierce that when he barks, even the prince and the Radisha jump. Aloud, Lady wondered what Howler's raids were meant to accomplish. Swan blurted Bucket's answer. He wanted to pick off black company guys. That's obvious. I see, Lady asked. Is there more? One of the Gnar replied. Mogaba wouldn't test himself against lesser men. Long Shadow might want to remove those so he can better manipulate Mogaba's obsessions. Or he might be trying to initiate the final battle by being a continuous irritant. The prince nodded to himself. Now he was watching Lady with that gleam in his eye. Was it the fatal lure of evil? Perhaps he does want to bring Croker to the front. How many times over the centuries has Lady stood like that, about to loose fire and sword? She said, we do need to move this headquarters nearer to the action. The communications lag has become unacceptable. Swan, hand me that map there. Swan plucked a map off a sideboard cluttered with mystic paraphernalia. His caution indicated that he found that stuff obscure and wanted it to stay that way. The map portrayed the far south. A large blank space on its left was labeled Shindaikus, which was a desert. Beyond the unmapped nether edge of the desert was additional blank space labeled ocean. Beginning in the Shindaikus, running east and curving northward, are mountains generically referred to as the Danda Presh. They become rougher and rougher as they swerve around to form, eventually, the eastern limits of the Taglian territories. The range changes its local name frequently. It's supposed to be impassable east of the Shindaikus, except through the high pass at Charandaprash. Long Shadow, Shadow Catch, and Overlook lie on the far side of the Danda Prash. Mogaba's army was the cork in the pass, bottlenecking the road south. For ages, a common subject when officers weren't listening was how badly would we get whipped if we took a crack at Mogaba. A racket apparently arose outside because Swan jumped to the window. A courier, he announced. I could hear no sound from outside that room. In fact, when I did glance out the window, I could see nothing but grayness. Strange. Lady elbowed Swan aside. Can't be good news. Get him before he talks too much. Swan returned quickly. It's not too bad. Seems a really huge mob of Shadar and Vedna fanatics were chasing Blade and had the bad luck to catch him. 
What? That wasn't news. I knew about it. The Shadow Master knew about it. Of course. Lady didn't have a smoke or a screaming nut sidekick with a flying carpet. And I had known for just a little while. Maybe it seemed longer because I learned it so far away. What are you babbling? Lady demanded. Blade wiped out over 5,000 religious goofs who were after him to punish him for his religious excesses. Blade was pretty hard on temples and priests when he had the opportunity. His religious attitude had a lot to do with his running away, too. He had made thorough, blood-bitter enemies of all Taglian priests long before his falling out with the old man. The devout considered his fall from favor a blessing from heaven. I was confident that the priests secretly looked forward to all of our fates becoming gifts from the angels. Five thousand. Maybe more. Maybe up to seven thousand. Loose on their own, how could that happen? Neither the ruling family nor we liked having huge groups of armed men not under our control, blundering around righting wrongs. Out. All of you, out of here. Come back in two hours. Lady started murmuring the instant she was alone. That damned croaker. She grabbed stuff off the sideboard. He's out of his mind. I learned that you got damned focused out there with smoke. Time could rush past if you let yourself become introspective. Fragments of all that was happening to me came to me in no rational order, and I almost got lost trying to piece the puzzle together. Realization and resulting terror feeble as it was out there, brought me back to the present in the place I was watching when I lost my concentration. Hours had passed. Lady was still grumbling about the old man. What's the matter with him? How could he believe those damned rumors? She was angry. She had managed some mystic scrying of the distant battlefield as it appeared after the event. All that carnage had left her more upset. Damned fool. It was the worst disaster for Taglian arms since Dejagore. From some hidden recess in the sideboard, she produced a piece of black cloth. I was startled, despite having studied her annals closely. That was the silk rummel of a master strangler she began exercising with the killing scarf. Maybe that helped her relax. She was upset because she'd been left out of something. Usually she was the captain's partner. Got you a clue, woman, I thought. Lately, he's cutting everybody out. Lady Scar flashed. She was good. I wondered. Was there still some connection with Kina? Did Croker fear there might be? They were not called deceivers for nothing. She calmed herself. She sent for her counsel. Once they gathered, she said, There were survivors from that battle. Some are still there burying the dead. Catch me a few. Chapter 53 Croker never came to the hidden room. Neither did one eye nor even the Roddy Shah to torment our prisoner. Nobody wakened me. I drifted back there almost without design, perhaps summoned by my body. I'd been gone a long time. Longer than the subjective time spent out there. 
My stretch of introspection must have extended farther than it had seemed. My stomach was roaring, but Mother Goda's baked rocks were all gone. The strangler had gotten the cloth off himself again. He watched me wide-eyed. I got the feeling he'd been about to do something that I would regret. I discovered that he'd managed to work one hand free. You naughty boy. I took a long pull off the pitcher of water, then fixed him up again. Then I tried to decide whether to risk the labyrinth once more, in an effort to get to some of Mother Goda's lethal chow, or to stay and take yet another look at the wide world through Smoke's eyes while I awaited help. Water. Sorry, pal. I don't think so. Unless maybe you want to tell me what your buddies are up to. My belly grumbled again. The strangler didn't answer. Weak as he was, his will remained firm. Even ignoring my own presence, it seemed somebody should have come to feed him. It was late. Maybe Mother Goda was asleep and Sari would handle my meal. She didn't cook like she was out for vengeance. I was at the doorway, trying to make up my mind. Was there some way to mark my passage? Some way to follow footprints in the dust? But there was no light. This part of the palace was not in regular use. No one maintained any candles or torches. The lamp in the chamber behind me would be the only light available. Unless I waited till daylight, when the sun would steal in through random cracks and tiny windows. I glanced back at the lamp. It had been burning a long time. No one had been by to fuel it. I ought to see about refilling it before I did anything else. There was a metallic sound from far, far away, come around a hundred corners and down the rambling halls. It chilled me despite Taglios's natural heat and humidity. Water. Shut up. I found a beaker of lamp oil, cocked my head while I worked. The metallic sound didn't repeat itself. I hadn't covered the strangler again. When I glanced at him, I discovered his death's head face stretched in a grin. It was the grin of death. Spilling oil, I flung myself out of there. I got lost again. Fast. Chapter 54 Lost in the palace wasn't a matter for panic, so I didn't. I confess to a certain amount of frustration, though. You would think my situation vulnerable to the application of common sense. I sure thought so. One good rule proved to be not to enter any corridor dustier than the one I was using. Another was to avoid apparent shortcuts religiously. They never led anywhere I wanted to go. Most important was, don't yield to emotion or frustration. The palace is the only place in the world where you can step through a doorway and end up on a different floor. I found out the hard way. And it was not any sort of elf magic. It came from the place being a conglomeration of ages and ages of add-ons built upon very uneven ground. My anxiety reached the point where I elected to pursue what seemed the wimp route. I decided to go down to ground level, find one of the palace's thousand postern doors, which can be opened only from the inside, and get out into the street. Out there I would know where I was. I would walk around to the entrance I used regularly. Then I would be home. It's really dark in there in the middle of the night. I found that out after I stumbled descending a stair and dropped my lamp. It broke, of course, and for a while there was a lot of light down below. But soon the fire burned out. Oh, well. 
It was a certainty that there would be a door to the street below. The stairwell curved down against an exterior wall. I had leaned out a window to make sure before I ever entered it. Descending an ancient stair that spirals isn't easy when there are no handrails and you can't see what you're doing. Nevertheless, I got to the bottom without breaking any bones, although I did slip a couple of times, and endured one long spell of vertigo after passing through the smoke from the burned lamp fuel. Eventually the stair ended. I felt around for a door. As I did so, I frowned. What was I doing? It took me a moment to reach back into my head and bring up the answer. I found the door, felt around for a release. I found an old-fashioned wooden latch bar, which wasn't what I expected at all. I yanked, pushed. The door swung outward. Wrong answer to your problem, Mergen. Within that fastness, nothing moves, though at times mists of light shimmer as they leak over from beyond the gates of dream. Shadows linger in corners and way down inside the core of the place, in the feeblest throb of the heart of darkness. There is life of a sort. A massive wooden throne stands upon a dais at the heart of a chamber so vast only a sun could light it all. Upon that throne, a body sprawls, veiled by shoals of shadow, pinioned by silver knives driven through its feet and hands. Sometimes that body sighs softly in its sleep, impelled by bitter dreams a crawl behind its sightless eyes. This is survival of a sort. In the night, when the wind no longer licks through its unglazed windows, nor prances along its untenanted halls, nor whispers to its million creeping shadows, that fortress is filled with the silence of stone. Chapter 55 No will. No identity. At home in the house of pain. Chapter 56 There you are! Where have you been? Welcome back to... The House of Pain. Chapter 57 The House of Pain. I went there but do not remember the journey or the visit. I was on hands and knees on broken pavement. My palms and knees hurt. I lifted a hand. My palm was torn. Blood oozed from a dozen abrasions. My mind was numb. I raised my other hand, began picking out bits of paving brick. Fifty yards away, the side of a building glowed olive, pulsating. A circle of masonry blew outward. Shadows sprang out of the darkness. With weapons bare, they scrambled through the hole. Shouts and the clang of metal came from inside. I got up and wandered in that direction, vaguely interested but not sure why, not even thinking definable thoughts. Hey! A shadow at that hole stared at me. I didn't yell, so that must have been the shadow. That you, Mergen? I kept walking, head spinning. My course curved to the right. I banged into the side of a building. After that, I had a sure means of navigation. Like a drunk, I steered by keeping one hand on the wall. Here he is! The shadow pointed at me. Candles. Yeah. You all right? What did they do to you? I had little pains everywhere. 
I felt like I'd been stabbed and cut and burned. Who? Nobody did anything, did they? Where am I? When? Huh? A man leaned through the side of the building. He wore a scarf wrapped around his face. Only his eyes were visible. He studied me momentarily, popped back inside. Somebody in there yelled. People jumped into the street. Some carried bloody weapons. All were masked. A couple grabbed my arms and took off. We scurried through darkened streets in a nighted city, and no one would answer my panted questions, so for a while I had no idea when I was or where. Then we crossed an open space from which I glimpsed the citadel of Dejigore. That answered my most immediate questions. But a new crop sprouted. Why were we outside the company's part of town? How had I gotten there? Why didn't I have any memories of this? I recalled sitting with Kidam, secretly lusting after his granddaughter. The men accompanying me removed their wraps and masks. They were company, plus Uncle Doge and a couple of Nguyen Bao sprites. We ducked into an alleyway that led to Nguyen Bao territory. Slow down, I gasped. What's going on? Somebody snatched you, Candles explained. At first we thought Mogaba did it. Huh? Shadow Spinner's taken his whole army off after Lady. We could walk away if we wanted. We thought he decided to take a hostage. I didn't believe Spinner was gone. Uncle Doge. The last thing I remember was sipping tea with the speaker. You began to behave oddly, Stone Soldier. I growled. He didn't apologize. The speaker thought perhaps you had been drinking before you arrived. He instructed Tai Day to take you home. He was offended. You proved to be such a burden that Tai Day was unable to defend himself when you were attacked. He was beaten badly, but managed to get home with word. Your friends began looking for you as soon as we informed them. His tone suggested that he wondered why they'd bothered. They seem more skilled than they pretend. They pinpointed you quickly. You were not in the citadel, which is where Mogaba would have confined you. How did I get clear across town? I winced. In addition to the other pains, I had a hangover-type headache. I'd been drugged. Nobody had an answer for me. Is this the same night, Uncle? Yes, but many hours later. And it definitely wasn't Mogaba that grabbed me. No, there were no Na in that place. In fact, soon after you were taken, someone attacked Mogaba too. They may have planned to murder him. Jai Curry? Maybe the locals wanted to get to the heart of the problem. Perhaps. He didn't sound convinced. Maybe he should have taken prisoners. Where's One Eye? Only One Eye could have ripped that hole in the wall back there. The candles told me. Covering our back trail. Good. I was near normal now, which meant I was as confused as ever, I guess. Whoever grabbed me had done some slick work to sneak through Nguengbao territory unnoticed. Uncle Doge divined my thoughts. We have not determined how the villains managed to ambush you, nor how the others got so close to Mogapa. Those four did pay in blood. He killed them? By all reports, it was an epic battle. Four against one. Goody for Mogaba. Even he deserves a little happiness in life. We were approaching the tenement that masqueraded as company headquarters. 
I invited everybody in. The boys got a fire going. When one eye showed up, I suggested he see if he couldn't scare up some beer. That I had heard there was some floating around, and we sure could use a drink. Grumbling, one eye returned to the night. Before long, he and Goblin turned up lugging a barrel. On me, I told everybody. One eye made a whining noise. I stripped down and flopped onto a table, which is why the fire to take the edge off the chill. How do I look, One-Eye? His tone was that of a man responding to a stupid question. Like a guy that's been tortured. You don't know how you ended up in the street? My guess is they heard you coming and tossed me out to distract you while they got away. Dead in the wark. Roll onto your side. I spotted a face outside the open door. Come in here. Have a beer with us. The outsider, Sindhu, joined us. He accepted a mug but appeared to be very uncomfortable. I noted how closely Uncle Doge watched him. Chapter 58 It was still that same adventurous night. I was still disoriented, still hurting, and definitely still exhausted. But here I was wrapping a rope around me so I could rappel down the outside of the wall. You sure the Nar can't see us from the gate tower? Damn it, kid, will you just go? You fuss worse than a mother-in-law. One I might know. He's had several. I started down. Why did I let Goblin and One-Eye con me into this? Two Taglian soldiers were waiting when I reached the crude raft. They helped me board. I asked, how deep is the water? Seven feet, the taller man replied. We can pole across. The rope stirred. I held it. Soon, the outsider Sindhu dropped onto the raft. Mine was the only help he got. The Taglians wouldn't even acknowledge his existence. I tugged the rope three times hard to let the top end know we were going. Start polling. The Taglians were volunteers chosen in part because they were well rested. They were quite happy to be leaving the city and depressed because they would not get to stay gone. They considered this crossing an experiment. If we made it over, slipped through the Southerners, then got back to Dejagore tomorrow night or the next, soon whole fleets would hazard the crossing. If we got back. If Shadow Spinner's men didn't intercept us. If we found Lady at all, which the soldiers didn't know to be part of the mission. One Eye and Goblin browbeat me into looking for Lady. Never mind them injuries, kid. They ain't shit. Sindhu was along because Ki Dom thought it was a good idea to get him out of Dejagore. Sindhu's opinion had not been asked. The Taglians were supposed to guard me and provide strong backs. Uncle Doge had wanted to come, but had failed to convince the speaker. The crossing was uneventful. Once we stepped ashore, I retrieved the tiny green wooden box from my pocket and released the moth inside. It would fly back to Goblin, its arrival announcing my safe arrival. I had several more boxes, each a different color, and each containing a moth to be released in a particular circumstance. As we started to move up a ravine, Sindhu quietly volunteered to take the point. I am experienced at this sort of thing, he told me, and I believed him within minutes. He moved very slowly, very carefully, making no sound. I did all right, but not as well. The two Taglians might as well have worn cowbells. We hadn't gone far before Sindhu hissed a warning. We froze. 
while grumbling shadowlanders filed across our track twenty yards uphill. I caught only enough conversation to understand that they preferred a warm blanket to a night patrol through the hills. Surprise. You would think things would be different in somebody else's army. We encountered another patrol an hour later. It too passed without detecting our presence. We were past the ridge line when dawn began creeping in from the east, extending visibility to the point where it was too dangerous to keep moving. Sindhu told me, We must find a place of concealment. Standard procedure in unfriendly territory. And it was no problem. The ravines out there were choked with brush. A man could disappear underneath easily, as long as he remembered not to wear his orange nightshirt. We disappeared. I started snoring seconds after we went to ground. And I didn't go anywhere else or any when. The smell of smoke wakened me. I sat up. Sindhu rose at almost the same instant. I found a crow studying me from so close I had to cross my eyes to focus on him. The Taglian who was supposed to be keeping watch was sleeping. So much for well-rested. I said nothing. Neither did Sindhu. In moments, my fears were confirmed. A southern voice called out. Another answered. Crows laughed. Sindhu whispered, they know we are here? It sounded like he had trouble believing that. I lifted a finger requesting silence. I listened, picked out a few words. They know somebody's here. They don't know who. They're unhappy because they can't just kill us. The Shadow Master wants prisoners. They aren't trying to lure us out. They don't know any of us can understand some of their dialect. The albino crow in front of me cawed and flapped its way up out of the brush. About twenty others joined it. If we cannot evade them, we must surrender. We must not fight. Sindhu was an unhappy young man. I agreed. I was an unhappy young man myself. The Taglian soldiers were two more unhappy young men. We evaded nothing and no one. The crows found our efforts amusing. Chapter 59 Time had no meaning. The Shadow Master's camp lay somewhere north of Dejagore. We four were among the earliest prisoners taken, but more soon joined us in our pen. Lots of Mogaba's guys wanted to leave town. He would have less trouble feeding the ones who stayed behind. One Eye and Goblin seemed to hold our part of town together. Nobody I knew became a prisoner. I didn't send any more moths so they knew I had found trouble instead of Lady. Even our guards had no notion how Spinner meant to use us. We were happier not knowing, probably. I spent uncounted days in total misery. Piglets in a feedlot lived better than we did. More and more prisoners arrived. The food was inadequate. After a few meals, everybody got the runs. There were no sewage provisions, not even a simple slit trench. They wouldn't let us dig our own. Maybe they didn't want us getting too comfortable. In fact, our life wasn't much worse than that of the Shadowlander private soldiers. They had nothing anymore and could expect only nothing. They indulged in a ferocious desertion rate despite the Shadow Master's reputation. They hated Shadow Spinner for putting them into such an awful state. They took their anger out on us. I don't know how long we were there. 
I lost track. I was busy trying to die from dysentery. I noticed only that there was a sudden absence of crows one day. I was so used to having crows around that anymore, I noticed them only when they were not there. I faded in and out. I suffered a bunch of my spells. They were more frequent now and left me emotionally drained. The shits left me physically drained. If I could only get some sleep. Sindhu wakened me. I recoiled from his touch. It was astonishingly cold and seemed vaguely reptilian. I was the only man in the pen he knew, so he wanted to be my pal. I was willing to do without a friend. He offered me a cup of water. It was a rather nice tin cup. Where'd he get that? Drink, he said. It's clean water. All around us prisoners lay in the mud, twitching endlessly in haunted sleep. Some cried out. Sindhu continued. Something is going to happen. What? I felt the breath of the goddess. For an instant I smelled something that was not the stink of vomit or unwashed bodies or dead men or pools of liquid shit, too. Ah, Sindhu whispered. It's happening now. I looked where he pointed. The happening something was going on inside the big tent belonging to the Shadow Master. Lights of strange color flickered and flared. Maybe he's getting something special ready for somebody. Maybe he had Lady spotted. Sindhu snorted. He seemed to thrive in these conditions. The something went on a long time but attracted no attention. I became suspicious. I had Goblin's ward against sleep spells set on me. Oh? I dragged myself to the compound fence. When nobody smashed me back with the butt of a spear, I was sure. The camp was under an enchantment. Sindhu's water gave me strength quickly and started my brain perking. It occurred to me that if no one was inclined to stop me, this might be the perfect time to take leave of the Shadow Master's hospitality. I started worming my way between the fence rails. My stomach rumbled in protest. I ignored it. Sindhu grabbed my arm. His grip was iron. He said, Wait! I waited. What the hell? That was one of my favorite arms. I didn't want to deprive myself of its company. The moon began to rise, a big old squashed orange egg in the east. Sindhu continued to restrain me and continued to stare at the big tent. A shriek drifted down from high above. Holy shit, I muttered. Not him. Sindhu cursed too. He was so startled that he let me go. He glared upward. That's the howler, I told him. Really bad news. Shadow Spinner could take advanced cruelty lessons from him. The side of Spinner's tent opened. Out rushed a bunch of people carrying what proved to be human body parts. I recognized some of them. The people, that is. Who could mistake Willow Swan with his wild yellow mane? Or Lady, who carried a severed head by its mangy hair? And Blade was only a step behind her, his ebony skin shining in the moonlight. I didn't recognize any of the others. The sleep spell on the camp laid rather poorly, unraveled. Southerners jumped up to ask what was happening. Metal clanged and jingled as weapons and mail were located. One of Lady's companions, a huge Shadar, 
started bellowing something about bowing down to the true daughter of night. Sindhu chuckled. Nothing bothered him, it seemed. He could take anything. He wasn't holding on to me, but I no longer had the strength or inclination to go anywhere. Chapter 60 They pulled it off. Lady and her damn fool gang. Audacity pays. They slipped into the camp, murdered Shadow Spinner, and when they got caught, they convinced the Southerners that it was all fated and they shouldn't go doing anything because of that. I couldn't be much of a witness to their mass conversion. My bowels overruled my desire to observe. I spent most of my time making a worse mess of myself. At some point, our former guards decided to bring us to Lady's attention in an effort to curry favor. Blade recognized us as they brought us out of the pen. Blade looks like he might have been born Nar. Like them, he's tall, black, and muscular, without an ounce of fat on him. He says little, but has a strong presence. His background is shadowy. He ran with Willow Swan and Cordy Mather, who saved him from crocodiles several thousand miles north of Taglios. What everyone knew for sure, what Blade made no effort to hide, was that he hated priests, singly, collectively, and without any prejudice whatsoever, where belief system was concerned. Once I thought he was an atheist, who hated the whole idea of gods and religion, but after further exposure I decided it was only the retailers of religion he detested. That suggested sharp incidents in his past. No matter now, Blade took Sindhu and I away from our guards. Standard bearer, you stink. Call out the ladies in waiting. Let them give me a bath. I couldn't remember my last bath. In Dejagore, we didn't waste water on trivialities. Of course, now we could all bathe all we wanted, although the water would be unclean. Blade obtained fresh clothing by the expedient of robbing some southern officers. Had us clean up and visit the inadequate field physicians Croker had tried to train for the Taglian forces. They knew less about stopping the drizzling shits than I did. It was daylight when Lady saw me. She already knew the prisoners were deserters from the city. She was blunt. Why did you run out, American? I didn't. We decided somebody had to come find you. I lost the election. Ah. Uh, she was in a bleak mood, apparently pretty sick herself. Never mind the humor, Mergen. One eye and goblin figured I was the only trustworthy guy who had any chance of getting through. They couldn't leave. I didn't make it, though. Why did you feel the need to send someone? Mogaba elected himself God. With the water around us, keeping the Southerners back, he doesn't need to get along with anybody who doesn't agree. Sindhu said, The black men believe they serve the goddess mistress, but their heresies are grotesque. They have become worse than unbelievers. I pricked up my ears, Maybe I would learn something about Sindhu's bunch. I had bones to pick with them. I hadn't yet found any evidence to suggest that it wasn't them who kidnapped me and took a crack at murdering Mogaba. Still, I couldn't imagine why they would bother. Sindhu and Lady talked. Her question sounded vaguely doctrinal. Sindhu's replies made no sense. Once Lady interrupted the interview to be sick. A skinny little gink named Narayan, who kept hanging around, seemed inordinately pleased. I noted that Sindhu showed him considerable deference. 
I wasn't happy. The little I knew of their cult assured me that I didn't want them influencing my captains. The interview ended. Blade's cronies took me away. I got to hang out with Swan and Mather, meaning I had somebody to speak a reasonable language with for a while, but soon I felt like a forgotten man. What are we doing? I asked Swan. I don't know. Cordy and I just tag along behind her lordship, pretending not to be watching her for the Prabrindra Dra and Radisha. Pretending? Ain't much good being a spy if everybody knows it, is there? Anyway, Cordy gets to do all the worrying. He's the one playing patty cake with the woman. You mean, that ain't just a vicious rumor? He's really pluking the Radisha? Hard to believe, ain't it? She's got a face like... Hey, Cordy! Where's them cards? We got us a pigeon here thinks he can play Tonk. Thinks? Swan, you're gonna think I invented the game if you get into it with me. Mather was a nondescript character of average height with ginger hair who stood out only because he was white in a land where nobody but harem girls, kept out of the sun from birth, had fair skin. He asked, Willow's mouth running away with him again? Maybe. I've made a career playing Tonk. Hell, they boot you out of the black company if you don't make journeyman player. Mather shrugged. Then you'll twist Willow's head back around straight for him. Here, deal. I'll see if the mighty General Blade wants to sit in. Swan grumbled. That would take him out of sight of Lady. Sounded like some sour grapes there. Mather showed him a smirk that confirmed my guess. What is it about her? I asked. Every damned guy that walks on his hind legs gets near her for five minutes. He starts floating around with his tongue hanging down, banging into things. But I've been around her for years. I can see she's got the right stuff in the right places, put together about as good as you could want, but I don't think I could get excited even if she didn't used to be the lady and she wasn't married to the old man. Not that that was literally true. They hadn't even bothered to jump over a sword. Swan shuffled. Cut. I cut. I always cut. One eye taught me that. Swan asked. You really don't feel it? Man, she comes around me and my brain goes south. And she's a widow now, so... I don't think so. What? She ain't no widow. Croker's still alive. Shit. That'd be my luck, too. You want to stack Cordy a hand, make him think he's got a winner, then skunk him? As soon as I shook my head, he wanted to know how come I thought Croker was alive. I evaded a definitive answer for the few moments it took Mather to return. Blade's too busy looking for an angle to use while he's close to the magic. You load me up again, Willa? No? Bullshit. Let's just pick them up and deal them over. Ain't this the story of my life? I grumbled. Look here. I had two aces, a pair of deuces, and a tray. An automatic winner. Damned near couldn't be beat. And that's a true natural, no help. Swan snickered. Don't matter. You don't got anything to do anyway. You got a point. Why don't you guys come over to Dejigore? I'll buy you a mug of One Eye's home brew. <laughs> Competition, huh? Swan and Mather had gone into the brewing business back when they first came to Taglios. They were out of the racket now. Among their reasons, the fact that the priests of all the native religions condemned the use of alcohol. I doubt it. The only thing good about their brew is it gets you skunked. 
That was the only good thing about the rat piss we made, Mather said. My dear old daddy, the brewmaster, rolled over every time we tapped another keg. We never laid any beer up, Swan countered. Soon as it was ripe, we skimmed the scum off and poured it down Taglian throats. And don't buy that shit about his daddy, neither. Old man Mather was a tax assessor who was so dumb he didn't take bribes. Shut up and deal. Mather snatched up his cards. He did brew his own beer. And Swan's old man was a hot carrier. But a handsome one, Cordy. And a lover. I inherited his good looks. You take after your mother. And if you don't do something about that hair pretty soon, you're going to wind up in somebody's harem. This was a side of these guys I hadn't seen before. But I hadn't spent much time loafing with them. They weren't company. I kept my mouth shut and concentrated on my cards and let them tell me about who they used to be before the wander dust settled on their shoes and sent them roving against all odds. What about you, Mergen? Swan asked, after he noticed that I was winning more than my share of hands. Where did you come from? I told them about growing up on a farm. There wasn't anything exciting about my life, until I decided that farming wasn't what I wanted to do. I joined one of ladies' armies, found out I didn't like the way things were done there, deserted and joined up with the Black Company, which was the only place I could hide with the provost after me. Mather asked, You ever regret leaving home? Every goddamned day, Mather. Every goddamned day. It was boring, raising potatoes, but not one time did I ever have a spud try to stick a knife in me. I was hardly ever hungry and almost never cold, and the landlord was all right. He made sure his tenants had enough before he took his share. He didn't live much better than we did. Oh, and the only magic we ever saw was the kind your wandering conjurers perform at town fairs. So why not go home? Can't. If you're careful and don't look prosperous and don't go around pissing people off, you can travel almost anywhere safely. We did. I can't go home, because home ain't there no more. A rebel army came through a couple years after I left. The company passed through later still, marching from somewhere unpleasant to somewhere where we would be unhappy. The whole country had been turned desert in the name of freedom from the tyranny of the ladies' empire. Chapter 61 Lady sent for me after six days. I had shaken the runs and had eaten well enough to regain a few of the pounds I lost in the pen. I still looked like a refugee from hell, and I was. I was indeed. Lady didn't look good. Tired, pale, under severe pressure, apparently still fighting the sickness that had her puking the other day. She wasted no time on small talk. I'm sending you back to Dejagore, Mergen. We're getting disturbing reports about Mogapa. I nodded. I'd heard some of them. Every night more rafts crossed the lake. The deserters and refugees always were astonished to learn that Shadow Spinner was dead and Lady controlled his army. Though that was evaporating through desertion, too. Lady was a hard one. My guess was she meant to let the problem posed by Mogaba solve itself, despite what that would cost Taglios and the Black Company. Why? That wasn't smart. All those Taglians in there had relatives back home. Many were people of place and substance, for it was that sort who'd volunteered to defend Taglios. I need you to just go back and be yourself. But write things down. 
hone your skills. Keep the company together. Be prepared for anything. I grunted. That wasn't something I wanted to hear, knowing that the siege could be ended right now. Lady sensed my reservations. She smiled wanly and made a sudden gesture. Sleep, Mergen. I collapsed on the spot. She was her nasty old self. My mind wouldn't clear. The Taglians who'd helped me leave Dejagore were like zombies. They didn't talk and seemed almost blind. Down, I muttered. Patrol coming. They did what I said, but like men heavily drugged. Patrols were few by day. It was easy to elude them. It wasn't their mission to keep people out anyway. We reached Lakeside without any trouble. Rest, I ordered. Wait for dark. I wasn't sure why we'd crossed the hills by day. I didn't recall starting. Have I been acting real weird? I asked. The taller Taglian shook his head slowly. Not quite sure. He was more confused than I was. I said, I feel like I walked out of a fog a couple hours ago. I remember getting captured. I remember them keeping us in a nasty pen. I know there was a fight or something, but I don't remember how we got away. Nor do I, sir, the shorter soldier said. I do have a very strong feeling that we need to get back to our comrades quickly, but I don't know why. How about you? The taller man nodded, frowning. He was going to bust a vein trying to remember. I said, maybe Shadow Spinner did something to us and let us go. That's worth keeping in mind, especially if you have urges that really surprise you. After dark, we stole along the shoreline till we found a raft, jumped aboard, and headed for Dejigore, and discovered immediately that we were going to get nowhere using poles. The water was too deep. We ended up using poles and broken boards as inefficient paddles. It took us half the night to make the crossing. And then, naturally, everything went to hell. One eye was on watch and had been passing the time making love to a keg of beer. He heard water splash and people ask for a hand up and concluded that the evil hordes were upon him, whereupon he flung fireballs hither and yon so any handy archers could plink us. One eye recognized me before more than three or four arrows whizzed past. He yelled for a ceasefire, but the damage had been done. The gnar at the north gate saw us. We were far enough away that they shouldn't recognize faces. But the possibility that the old crew might have outside contacts would get Mogaba's interest. Hi, kid. Good to see you, one eye said as I clambered to the top of the wall. We thought you was dead. We was going to have a funeral in a few more days if we got time. I've been stalling it. Account of if you was officially dead, then I'd have to start keeping the annals. Generously, he offered me a drink from his very own, unwashed for a fortnight mug. I declined the honor. You all right, kid? I don't know. Maybe you can tell me. I told him what I could remember. You have another spell? If I did, these guys had it with me. And Tristan, come around and see me about it tomorrow. Tomorrow? I'm going to be off watch in ten minutes, and I intend to hit the sock. And you need some sleep yourself. My pal. Don't know what I would do if I didn't have one eye to worry about me. 
Chapter 62 Bucket wakened me. One of Mogaba's guys is here, Mergen. Says his majesty wants to see you. I groaned. Does it have to be so bright out there? I hadn't bothered to go down into the warrens. He's pissed off. We've been pretending you were here but couldn't talk to him. The goblin and one eye put doubles of you on the wall sometimes so the Nar could see you. And now you have the real Mergen back, you want to throw him to the wolf? Uh, well, he didn't ask for nobody else. Meaning, he didn't want Goblin or One-Eye. He wanted to stay away from those two. Find my bitty buddies and tell them I need them. Now. The wizards turned up, at their own leisure, of course. I told them. Put me in a litter and lug me over to the Citadel. We're going to admit that you've been lying about me, but only because I was totally sick. What we were doing on that raft last night was taking baths. You thought it would be cute to pop off a few fireballs while I had my pants down. One I started to complain, but before he could start, I growled, I won't face Mogaba without backup. He don't have any reason to be nice anymore. He won't be in a good mood, Goblin predicted. There's been rioting. Food shortages are getting really bad. He won't turn one grain of rice loose. Even his hand-picked Taglian sergeants have started to desert. It's all falling apart for him, I said. He was going to take over and show the world wonders, but his followers can't match his iron will. And we're some kind of philanthropic brotherhood? One I muttered. We never kill nobody who don't ask for it. Come on, let's do it and be ready for anything, both of you. But first, we went up to the battlements, both so I could see this world by daylight and so the Nar at the North Gate could see me looking sick before I presented myself that way. The water level was just eight feet below the ramparts, higher than Hong Trey's prediction. Any flooding inside? Mokaba sealed the gate somehow. He has Jaikuri working parties, bucket brigade in what seepage there is. Good for him. How about down below? There are some seepage in the catacombs. Not a lot. We could keep up by hauling it up in buckets. I grunted. I stared at Shadow Spinner's lake. I saw more corpses than I could count. Those didn't float up from the mounds, did they? Goblin told me, Mogaba threw people off the wall during the rites, and some might be from rafts that turned over or broke up. I squinted. I could just make out a mounted patrol beyond the water. The raft with Jaikuri piled high had been caught by daylight. The people aboard were trying to move away from the waiting patrol by paddling with their hands. Ty Day turned up, so we knew his people were watching. I figured he would want me to visit the speaker. But he said nothing. I told my bearers, Take me to his worship. As we approached, I observed... The Citadel looks like something out of a spook story. And it did, with the sky overcast behind it and crows swarming around. Dejigore was a paradise for crows. They were going to get too fat to fly. Maybe we would get fat eating them. The gnar at the entrance would not let one eye and goblin inside. So take me home, I told them. Wait! Stick it, buddy. I got no need to put up with Mogaba's crap. The lieutenant is alive. So is the captain, probably. Mogaba ain't shit nowhere but inside his own head anymore. 
You could have at least argued until we were rested up. One eye started shuffling sideways so he could turn and head back down the steps. Ochiba caught us before we reached street level. He was cast in the same mold as Onar. His face remained neutral. Apology standard bearer. Won't you reconsider? Reconsider what? I don't especially want to see Mogaba. He's been eating magic mushrooms or chewing lucky weed or something. I've been shitting my guts out for over a week. I ain't in no shape to play games with no homicidal lunatic. Something fluttered behind Ochiba's dark eyes. Maybe he agreed. Maybe there was another war going on inside him. A struggle between keeping faith with Gaius Lee's greatest nar ever and keeping faith with his own humanity. I was not going to pursue it. Any hint of outside interest would push waverers in the direction of that's the way it's always been. That was the top two then, quietly questioning Mogaba's way. If these guys doubted him, things were probably worse than I thought. As you wish, Ochiba told the sentries. Let the litter bearers in. Nobody missed the significance of who my litter bearers were. It was a pretty direct statement. I felt comfortably confrontational. Chapter 63 Was Mogaba happy to see Goblin in one eye and them looking so fit? You better believe he wasn't. But he didn't pursue his displeasure. He just ticked something on his mental get-even slate. He would make me even more unhappy than he'd planned. Later. Can you sit up? He asked, almost like he cared. Yeah. I made sure. That's partly why it took so long. That, and I wanted to make sure I'd stay rational. Oh. I've been suffering severe fevers and dysentery for over a week. Last night they took me out and threw me in the water to cool me down. That worked. I see. Come to the table, please. Goblin and one eye helped me into a chair. They put on a fine show. There were just six people in the conference chamber. Us three and Mogaba, Ochiba, and Sindawe. Through the window behind Mogaba, I saw water and hills. And crows. They squabbled over space on the windowsill, though none would come inside. An albino turned an especially baleful pink eye my way. I suppose we looked too hungry. For one instant I saw that same room in another time, with Lady and some of the same faces around the same table. Mogaba was not among them. The window behind them opened on grayness. One eye pinched my earlobe. Kid... Now ain't the time. Mogaba watched intently. Less recovered than I thought, I explained. I wondered what the vision meant. And vision it was because it was too fully realized for imagination. Mogaba settled into a chair opposite me. He pretended solicitousness, avoided his usual assertiveness. We face numerous grave problems, Standard Bear. They are out there and indifferent to whatever animosities we have developed amongst ourselves. Goddamn, was he going to turn reasonable on me? They will be there whether or not we want to believe the lieutenant or captain survived. We will have to face them because I do not expect to be relieved any time soon. I wouldn't argue with that. We would be better off had Lady not interfered this last time. 
We are isolated and trapped now because the Shadow Master was forced to find a solution for managing two fronts. I nodded. We were in a worse situation. On the other hand, we would not have yowling hordes piling over the wall every few nights anymore. Nor would Mogava be flinging men hither and yon without regard for their lives, just trying to irritate the southerners into doing something stupid. Mogava glanced out the window. We could see two Shadowlander patrols raising dust in the hills. She can starve us out now. Maybe. Mogama grimaced but controlled his anger. Yes. For no rational reason, I feel confident that our friends will break us out. I must confess that I remain a stranger to that sort of faith. Although I concede the importance of maintaining an optimistic aspect in front of the soldiers. Was I going to argue? No. He was more right than I could be. So, standard bearer, how do we survive a protracted siege when most of our food stores are exhausted? How do we recover the standard once we do get out of these streets? I don't have any answers. Although I think the standard is in friendly hands already. Why was he interested? Almost every time we talked, he asked something about the standard. Did he believe possessing it would legitimize him? How so? He was surprised. The widowmaker that was here the first time carried the real standard. You're sure? I know it. I promised. Then share your thoughts about food. We could try fishing. Wisecracking wasn't a good idea with Mogapa. It just made Mogapa angry. Ain't no joke, Goblin snapped. That water comes down here from regular rivers. There's got to be fish. The little shit wasn't as stupid as he acted sometimes. Mogapa frowned. Do we have anyone who knows anything about fishing? He asked Sindawe. I doubt it. They meant among their Taglian soldiers, of course. Nar are warriors, back for a dozen generations. They don't sully themselves doing unheroic work. I was negligent. I failed to mention that the Nguang Bao came from country where fishing was probably a way of life. It's a thought, Mogaba told me. And there is always baked crew. He glanced back at the window. But most Taglians won't eat flesh. A conundrum. I agreed. I will not surrender. No reply seemed adequate. You have no resources either. Less than you. I lied. We still had a little rise from the catacombs, but not much. We were stretching ourselves every way possible, in accordance with hints recorded in the annals. We didn't look like famine victims. Not quite yet. We looked, I noted, less well-fed than did the Nar. Suggestions for reducing the number of unproductive mouths. I'm letting my worn-out Taglians and any locals who want build rafts and go. But I don't let them take anything with them. He controlled his anger again. That does consume valuable timber. But it is another thought worth consideration. I studied Sindawe and Ochiba. They remained jet statues. They weren't even breathing, it seemed. They expressed no opinions. Mogaba glared at me. I feared this meeting would be this non-productive. You haven't even thrown the annals in my face. The annals aren't magic. What they say about sieges is plain common sense stuff. Be stubborn, 
Ration. Don't support the non-productive. Control the spread of plague. Don't exhaust your enemy's patience if there's no hope of outlasting them. If surrender is inevitable, do it while your enemy is still amenable to terms. This enemy never offered. I wondered about that. Although the Shadow Masters did have a tendency to think like gods. Thank you, Standard Bearer. We will examine our options and keep you informed of what we mean to do. Goblin and One Eye helped me ease my chair back. They settled me into the litter. Mogaba said nothing else, and I could think of nothing I wanted to tell him. The other Nar just stood there awkwardly and watched us go. What was that in aid of? I asked once we were clear. I expected yelling and threats. He wanted to pick your brains, Goblin said. While he made up his mind if he was going to kill you. One I added cheerfully. Oh, that's real encouraging. He did decide, Morgan. And he didn't pick the option you want to hear. It's time to start being real careful. We did make it home unharmed. Chapter 64 Don't bother dragging me up there till we find out what Uncle wants. Goblin and one eye were at the foot of steps leading to the battlements. Doge was up top, looking down. I wasn't planning to carry your dead ass anywhere anyhow anymore. One eye told me. Far as I'm concerned, this exercise was for camouflage. Uncle Doge started downward. I stared at the wall. Tiny beads of sweat covered it, but that was because the stone was cooler than the air, not because water had begun seeping through from outside. The Shadow Masters were good builders. Stone Soldier, you are well? Not bad for a guy with the runs. Ready to dance in your grave, Stubby? We got business? The Speaker wishes to see you. Your excursion was not successful. He moved his head to indicate my trip outside. If you call spending two weeks as a guest of the Shadow Master a success, I tore them up, Uncle. Otherwise, all I did was get sick, lose some weight, then have barely enough sense left to run for it when some Taglians hit Shadow Spinner's camp with a nuisance raid. That's all right, I can walk that far. Just don't let me fall down any rabbit holes. I could walk to the speaker's place easily, but why give up the pretense of weakness if it might be useful? Nothing changed with the speaker's crew, except that this time one smell was absent. I noticed that as soon as I stepped inside. I couldn't identify the missing odor, though. The speaker was ready. Hong Tre was in place. The beautiful one had tea brewing. Kidam smiled. Tie day ran ahead. He read my curiosity from my glance and flaring nostrils. Don has gone to his judgment. At last, a bleak season has ended for this house. I couldn't help myself. I looked at the young woman. I found her looking at me. Her gaze shifted immediately, but not so fast that I didn't feel guilty when I returned attention to the speaker. The old man missed nothing. Neither did he get excited about something best left ignored. He was wise. Was Kidam. I had come to respect that frail oldster a lot. The hard times have come standard bare, and will lead to more terrible tomorrows. 
He reviewed my discussion with Mogaba well enough to convince me that someone had watched us. Why tell me this? To support my claim when I tell you we spy on the black men. After your departure, they spoke only their native tongue until they sent messengers to the tribunes of the cohorts and other senior taglians. They are to gather at supper time. Sounds big. The old man bowed slightly. I would like you to see something for yourself. You know these men more certainly than do I. You can determine if my suspicions are well founded. You want me to spy on that meeting? Something of the sort. The old man didn't tell me the whole story. Not then. He wanted me walking into it cold. Dodge will conduct you. Chapter 65 Doge conducted me. The way led through cellars as intricately connected as ours, but less care had been used in the tunneling. The people who did this just wanted to be able to sneak away. They'd had no intention of hiding. They must have been Jaikuri collaborators in Storm Shadow's administration, acting for her. She would have wanted an emergency exit. I'm surprised at you, I told Uncle Doge. I wouldn't think underground would occur to swamp people. I don't suppose there are a lot of tunnels in the Delta? Not many, he smiled. My guess is they've found the escape route through sheer blind luck, maybe coupled with an informed suspicion about how Storm Shadow's mind worked. Getting into the Citadel, then, was no problem, though it required some crawling. The architects had not been concerned with Storm Shadow's dignity. It was tough for me. I wasn't yet back to my best. We came to a small open space beneath a ladder. That rose straight up into infinity, so far as I could see by the light of one feeble candle. I had a feeling the candle was a luxury laid on for me, but the Nguyen Bao made this journey entirely in darkness. I couldn't have endured that. I dislike enclosed places intensely, despite having lived in them. Close places, darkness, recurring spells and visions were not a combination I wanted to attempt. I did seem more stable lately, I reflected. I set a hand and foot on the ladder. Uncle Doge grabbed my wrist, shook his head. What? Isn't that the way to the council chamber? My whisper rattled off like the scurry of mice. Not what the speaker wants you to see. Doge used almost no air when he whispered. Come. There was no crawling now, just a lot of easing along sideways in an airspace almost too narrow for Uncle. His belly was going to ache from rubbing against stone. I learned that there was a lot more to Storm Shadow Citadel than I'd seen in the little time I'd spent there these past few months. Down below there, beneath the surrounding plazas, were countless unsuspected storerooms and prison cells, armories and barracks rooms, cisterns and smithies. I whispered, they have supplies down here to hold out for years. Meaning the Nar and their favorites hold up inside the citadel. Storm Shadow had laid in a great store against the evil day. Mogaba had lied to me, just trying to find out how well off we old crew were. Was that what the old man wanted me to know? Was this why the Nguyen Bao had seemed to prosper, while everyone else became gaunt? Were they nibbling at these stores like mice, taking just a little here and there so their predations would go unnoticed? Uncle Doge beckoned. Hurry! Soon I began to hear a distant chanting. We may not be in time, Bone Warrior. Hurry! I didn't slug him, mostly because the racket would have alerted the singing men. 
I knew they were gnar before I saw a thing. I had heard the rhythms and style before, though not these particular lyrics. Always before, though, there had been joy in their work songs and celebrations. This song was cold and grim. Uncle Doge left the candle, tugged my elbow. We continued to step sideways until suddenly we were in an ordinary passageway, not some tight secret squeeze behind a wall. Nothing concealed the entrance to the hidden ways. That was just a shadowed corner, unlikely to entice a closer look. There was light out there, from candles and sconces widely spaced. The people in charge were frugal, despite their wealth. Uncle Doge placed a finger to his lips. We were near dangerous people, who might detect us in an instant. He dropped to his knees and led me right into a large chamber where most of the gnar had gathered. Lighting was non-existent except down where they were. Doge got behind a pillar. I squatted behind a low, dusty table just inside the doorway. I wished I was as dark as the gnar. My forehead must be shining like a little half-moon. This life hardens you. Too soon you have seen so much that when you encounter another something terrible, you don't howl and run in circles, snapping at your tail. But most of us still appreciate horror, if horror is there. Horror was there. There was an altar. Mogaba and Ochiba were involved in something ceremonial. Above the altar stood a small statue of dark stone, a four-armed woman dancing. I was too far away to make out details, but I was pretty sure she had vampire fangs and six teats. She might be wearing a necklace of baby skulls. The Nar might give her another name, but she was Kina. The worship offered by the Nar wasn't that described in the Jaikuri scriptures, though. The deceivers don't want to spill blood. That's why they're called stranglers. The Nar not only spilled blood on behalf of their goddess, they drank it. And it looked like they'd been doing so for some time down there. Drained corpses hung to one side. Their latest sacrifice, a hapless Jaikuri, got hoisted up with those soon after I arrived. The Nar were practical in their religion. After the grim ceremony ended, they began butchering one of the bodies. I got down and crawled out of there. I didn't give one rat's ass what Uncle Doge thought. I've seen a lot with the company, including tortures and cruelties almost beyond comprehension and inhumanities I don't have the capacity to fathom but never had I encountered socially sanctioned cannibalism. I didn't puke or boil over in outrage. That would be silly. I just put distance between me and that till I could speak without worrying about who might overhear. I've seen enough. Let's get out of here. Uncle Doge responded with a thin smile and lifted eyebrow. I have to relay this. I have to write it down. We may not survive the siege. They will. Word of what they are has to survive, too. He watched me closely. Was he wondering if the rest of us also enjoyed the occasional long pig roast as well? Probably. This sort of thing might go some toward explaining our ambiguous reception in these parts. Mogaba couldn't read. If it didn't occur to him that the dark side of the Nar was no secret anymore, I could leave word in my annals, to be salvaged by Lady or the old man. They are all down there, Uncle said. So we will return by a swifter path. By which he meant we would stroll through regular passageways, just like we belonged there. What's that noise? I asked. 
Uncle gestured for silence. We stole forward. We discovered a group of Taglian soldiers bricking up a sally port we could have used to leave. Why were they doing that? That door couldn't be broken open from the outside. It still had Storm Shadow spells protecting it. Uncle pulled me back, headed another direction. Obviously, he knew the Citadel quite well. And I had no difficulty imagining him roaming around in there all the time, just for the hell of it. He seemed like that kind of guy. Chapter 66 You look like somebody ate your favorite puppy, Goblin told me. Cracks like that could be heard all the time, now that there were no more dogs. There were just two sources of meat left. The gnar exploited both. We restricted ourselves to stupid crows. I told Goblin and One-Eye what I'd seen. Uncle Doge stood behind me, quietly disgruntled because I wanted to see my own people before I visited the speaker. I was barely halfway through it when one I interrupted. You got to tell the whole company this one, kid. For once, he was as serious as a spear through the gut. And for once, Goblin agreed with one Eye without any big groan and moan about the unfairness of it all. You need to get this word out exactly the way you want it known to everybody. There's going to be a lot of talk. You don't want anybody building it up worse than it is when they pass it along. Get them together, then. While I'm waiting, I'm going to skim those Jaikuri books. There may be something else I need to tell them. May I join you? Uncle Doge asked. No. Go tell the old man that I'll be there as soon as I can. This is family. As you will. He said something to Ty Day. Stalked away. Bucket interrupted my reading. Got them together, Mergen. All the cleat. He's off somewhere whoring, and even his brothers don't know where to find him. All right. It's something bad? You got that look? Yeah. It can get worse than it already is? You're going to hear all about it in just a little bit. In five minutes, I got up in front of sixty men and told my tale, marveling as I did that a band so frail and few could be so feared. More, I marveled that there were so many of us when, hardly more than two years ago, there were just seven of us pretending to be the Black Company. You guys want to keep it down until I'm done? The news had them excited, in a grim way. Listen up. That is the word. They're making human sacrifices and eating the corpses. But that ain't the whole story. Ever since they joined us at Gaius Lee, they've been hinting and even saying right out that us northern guys are heretics. That means they think the whole company used to do things their way. That started everybody talking and yelling. I pounded a mason's hammer on a block of wood. Shut up, you morons! It ain't the way the company ever was. The Nar never kept any annals. They would know that if they had. But they can't even read. I couldn't be absolutely sure that human sacrifice was never a company right. We were missing several early volumes of the annals, and I now suspected strongly that our earliest four brethren did follow a dark and hungry god, with breath so foul and cruel that even oral histories were enough to keep the native people terrified. Most of the guys didn't care about the implications. They were just angry because the Nar were going to make life harder for them. 
I told them, This is one more thing to make trouble between us and them. I want you all to realize that we might have to fight them before we get out of here. Tonight I'm bringing back some traditional business that we have let slide since Croker got to be captain. We are going to have regular readings from the annals, so you will all know what you become part of. This first reading is from the Book of Ket. This part probably set down by the analyst Agrip when the company was in service to the pain god of Chon Delore. Our four brethren endured a long and bitter siege then, though there had been a lot more of them to suffer. Additionally, I planned readings from books Croker recorded on the Plain of Fear when the company lived underground for so long. I dismissed the men to supper. One eye. No more groaning when I announce a reading, all right? These guys didn't live through that stuff. Chon Delore was way before my time, too. Then you need to hear about it. Kid, I've been hearing about it for two hundred years. Every damned analyst that ever was swallowed in the horrors of Chon Delore. I wish I could get my hands on those guys who did the book of Ket. You know Ket wasn't even the analyst. He was the... Goblin, grab Otto and hag up. I want a little confab with the oldest old crew. We five put our heads together, conjured a little something for the meanness. Once we had a scheme, I said, I'll see what the speaker thinks. Chapter 67 Kidam listened patiently, as an adult will to a bright child with an ingenious but impractical idea. He told me, You are aware this could spark fighting? Sure, but that's inevitable. Doge says Mogaba decided that at our meeting. Goblin and one I agree. So did Hagop and Otto. None of us favored a get-along effort. There are more of us than there are Nar. But their Taglians way outnumbered ours, and there was no way to guess how the Taglians with either group would jump. The old man turned to Hong Tre. A quizzical expression accentuated the lines at the corners of his eyes. Kisara knelt beside me, presenting tea. This was a step beyond anything previous. She met my wandering gaze. I don't think I slobbered. Hong Tre observed without reaction. That made her far calmer than I was. She focused on her husband, nodded. He said, there will be fighting. Soon. The Jaikuri will revolt. That wasn't what I wanted to hear. I asked, Will they bother your people or mine? I shouldn't have shoved in. I apologized immediately. Kisara poured more tea for me, before even she served her grandparents. Kigota manifested like a demon conjured for its serrated tongue, she barked at her daughter in a harsh, lilting gale. The old man looked up, said one word sharply. Hong Tre supported him with a complete sentence in what I would have to call a sharp whisper. It seemed she could speak no other way. Kigota withdrew. There were well-defined limits and absolute hierarchy inside the Ki family. I glanced at the beautiful woman. She met my eye again, rocked back, and rose, flushing. Was something going on? They wouldn't try to manipulate me, would they? It wouldn't work. No woman, not even this woman, was that special. And Ki Dom had seen enough of me to guess that about me. If he wanted to manipulate me, he would have better luck trading me the straight poop on why the hell everybody pissed blue when the company got mentioned. He and the old woman batted whispers back and forth in flurries. 
Suddenly, he told me, we will join you in this enterprise, Standard Bearer. Provisionally. Hong believes that fighting between the Jaikuri and the soldiers of the black men is imminent. It will be fierce, but might not touch the rest of us. That would provide sufficient distraction. But I must insist that Doge has the option to end it if it risks calling unfriendly attention to our people. Excellent. Of course. Done. Though I would have tried it without you. Kidam permitted himself a small smile, either at my enthusiasm or at the prospect of adding a little more misery to Mogaba's life. After dark, assuming the riots got started, we were going to steal Mogaba's food stores. Chapter 68 It started like a well-rehearsed play, where Mogaba's characters were desperate to please their audience. The rioting, that is. Uncle Doge and I formed work parties to take advantage. We got into the storage chambers without challenge. Ten old crew and ten Yuang Bao. We started dragging off sacks of rice and flour, sugar and beans. The riots were nasty from the start. They swamped the whole southern half of Dejigore. Every man Mogapa controlled was out there helping crush the rebellion. And every Jaikuri man and boy seemed to want to get at the Nar, even if they had to exterminate the whole First Legion to reach them. My people went on the alert, established in strong positions, long before nightfall. Likewise the Nguyen Bao, who had no immediate trouble. We ambushed one mob. A shower of missiles from front, sides, and above swiftly changed their minds. Mogaba's men had more problems. They weren't ready. Worse, they were scattered often in isolated work parties and patrols. For a while, everybody joked and cracked wise and speculated on Mogaba's first words after the fighting ended and he found his cellars plundered. I ran into Bucket my second trip back. Beans, I told him, dropping a huge sack. A change of diet will do us good. It's real bloody out there this time, Murgan. Mogaba has asked for support twice. We told him we couldn't find you. Well, keep on not being able. Unless it looks like we would end up worse off if we didn't help. That's not likely. He has most of the weapons. His men have been throwing people off the wall by the hundreds. Just anybody. Whether or not they're rebelling. Men, women, and children. That's Mogaba's way. What about those fires? There were a few. Whenever there's disorder, somebody starts burning things down. They're burning themselves out. Everything's going fine, then. But keep an eye out. I went back to my looting, happy as the proverbial clam. This might be the end of Mogapa as a royal pain in the ass. Uncle Doge caught me in the storage chamber later. Some Taglian soldiers are abandoning their posts for the safety of the Citadel. If we continue this raiding, we will get caught. Yeah. If we don't get spotted, Mogaba will blame it on natives who knew about the passageways. This raid was going to cost us our opportunity to spy on any more staff meetings. It was worth it. Would I feel the same way tomorrow, when Mogaba began looking for his stores, when I had a full belly? There is a small problem, Standard Bearer, Uncle Doge said a while later. Each of us staggered under a last sack of rice. We were the last brigands out. What's that? News of our success is sure to leak. Why? Only a few people know. It's in all their interest to stay clammed. 
Someone talked about what I showed you earlier. Huh? The dark ceremonies. Someone talked. The rumors sparked tonight's riots. I don't believe that. They were too organized. There was an organized cadre, naturally. But this uprising was more widespread. It is also out of control. Whatever you say. He'd spent his evening with me. He'd had no chance to observe any riots. Before he could respond, Tai Day popped out of the darkness. He gobbled away, becoming too animated for the space. If he killed my candle, I was going to choke him. As soon as I found him. What's happening? The black men are trying to break open the north gate and flood the city. They're what? That would take care of the riots, all right. But not even Mogaba would go that far. Would he? Uncle Doge and I did our best to run carrying sacks of rice. I bet we looked silly. Chapter 69 Otto, Hagop, One-Eye, Goblin, Geek, Freak, Bucket and Candles. You guys come with me. The Al Cool Company will help us. Weezer went to get them. We'll go straight along the battlements. If the Nar get in the way, we trample them. If they fight us, we kill them. That understood. Not even Goblin or One-Eye tried to lawyer. We were some of the people Mogaba meant to drown. The Taglians arrived. They were Vedna by religion, and the best Taglians attached to the company. They were reliable and almost friendly. Of six hundred who had come south from Taglios months ago, only about sixty were left. I explained what was happening, what I wanted to do about it, and how they could help. They would overrun anyone trying to open the gate after Goblin and One-Eye softened them up. Don't hurt anybody unless they just plain force you. Why not? Candles demanded. They're trying to hurt us. Mogaba is. These guys are just following orders. I'll bet you we don't find any Nar there when we get there. And I'll bet you that if they open the gate, they get hurt as bad as anybody else. Mogaba doesn't need them anymore. Let's just do it, Goblin groused. Or go back and catch a few beers. I moved them out. Maybe my blackouts gave me the gift of prophecy. There were no Nar at the North Gate. The fighting was so brief and desultory, it almost didn't take place. The Taglians working there fled. Damn. Mogaba would find out who foiled his latest nastiness. I told one eye. This will mean no more pretending we're buddies. Yeah. Show me how to sneak into the Citadel. I'll put a sleep spell on him then leave pieces of him all over his crazy temple. That didn't sound like a bad idea. We had no opportunity to implement it. Somebody yelled up at me. I peered down into the gloom. It was Uncle Doge. I hadn't included any Nguyen Bao in this. I had not seen any need to put them onto Mogaba's bad side, too. What? He shouted. This was a diversion. The real flooding will start at... Oh, shit. Yeah. Mogaba did know me well enough to anticipate that I might interfere. Come on, I snapped. Everyone! I hustled down to the street. Where? I demanded of Doge. Eastgate! Would Mogaba also anticipate me crossing town to spoil his game amidst the Jaikuri uprising? He might. 
He might hope my crew would get trapped and overrun or badly cut up. There was no guessing what he thought anymore. He was crazy. One eye and goblin eased us past bands of both Jaikuri and Taglians. We skirmished with the Jaikuri twice, our numbers and sorcery telling quickly. The light of scattered fires set scary shadows dancing everywhere. What a time for the Shadow Master to send his monsters out to play. We encountered barricades erected to protect the soldiers trying to open the gate. This time we faced Gnar as well as Taglians. A lot of shouting went back and forth. Some of their Guni Taglians tried to run away when our Vedna Taglians convinced them that Mogaba was trying to drown everybody. The Gnar cut down several would-be deserters. I told Goblin and One-Eye, You break up whatever they're doing to open the gate. The rest of you, let's chase them off. Go for the Gnar first. An instant later, an arrow found the eye of a Gnar named Endibo. Another of the Gnar speared the Geek, an incredibly handsome youngster who joined the company while we were crossing the savannah north of Gaia's Lee several years earlier. One eye hung the uncomplimentary name on him. He wore it with pride, refusing to be called anything else. For the first time in its history, insofar as I was aware, Company brother slew sworn brother in willful combat. Geek's blood brother Freak slew the Gnar responsible for Geek's death. But I never learned the Gnar's name, so I can't remember him here. Most of the First Legion Taglians took off then. Many of the Al Kul soldiers didn't want to fight either, although those other Taglians were goony. Still, quickly, a genuine small battle had friend hacking at supposed friend. I happened to glance back and noticed that armed Jaikuri had begun to gather to watch. Uncle Doge faced them alone, poised in a nod but apparently relaxed ready stance. Long sword vertical. Oh, shit! Goblin shrieked. God damn it! Look out! What? We're too late. It's going to go. Something began to grind and groan like the hinges of the world breaking loose. The masonry blocking the gateway bulged inward. The fighting stopped fast. Everybody faced the gate. A sudden spear of water shot through the bulge. Every man there took off, Nar and Black Company, Guni and Vedna Taglian, Jaikuri and Lone Nguyen Bao, running side by side, splitting up, heading whatever direction felt safest, but everybody always getting away from that gate. The masonry gave one final mighty groan. The water roared triumphantly and charged inside. Chapter 70 The water thundered through the gate, but there was no evidence of it yet where I stood. I was in a good mood, considering. While passing the citadel, I saw the Nar trying to shuffle their own kind inside without admitting any Taglians. I chuckled. Mogaba was going to bust a vein when he found the water coming in through his cellars. I now understood why those soldiers had been breaking up. The flood was no spur-of-the-moment plan. Mogaba must have nurtured the idea from the moment that Shadow Spinner had used water to isolate Dejagore. As we parted, I told Uncle Doge, Swim over and see me sometime. Fifteen minutes later, I was discussing waterproofing. Our measures had begun the day we started our warrants, but not in anticipation of anything like this. Enemies employing smoke and fire had been our real concern. Longo, you guys explored every part of those catacombs? They aren't open anywhere. 
I was surprised that Storm Shadow hadn't broken into them when she was building the Citadel. Maybe she got her location advice from knowledgeable locals. I didn't see anything. They were plastered good way back when because they were below the level of the plain. But if you put 70 feet of water out there and 30 in the street, sooner or later we'll find a way in. The best we can do, really, is fight a holding section. How about just sealing them off? We could try, but I wouldn't bother until flooding became a threat. We close them off, spring a leak up here. We got no place for the water to drain. I shrugged. Is everything that could be damaged up high? The guy started preparing for the worst back when the plane started flooding. We weren't weighed down with a lot of possessions. We're all right. We can hold out for a long time yet. We might want to beef up our fortifications a little, though. Do what you can. Longo and his brothers always saw a little more that could be done. Chapter 71 Mogaba counterattacked while the water was still just ankle-deep and the rest of the city was just starting to panic. He used all his taglions and encouraged cruel behavior. The slaughter was terrible. I may never discover the truth about the attack on the Nguyen Bao. It has been said that the taglion tribune Pao Subir misunderstood his orders. Others, like me, believe Mogaba was responsible. Maybe because he suspected the Nguyen Bao of looting his stores. I know he knew some had been plundered. He found out right away because he sent soldiers down to see if any water was getting inside. By questioning a few Jaikuri prisoners, he discovered that no locals were crowing about snatching a ton of food. Two, somebody in my outfit might have shot off his mouth again. Whatever. Pal Sabir's cohort, with transfer replacements to bring it to full strength, attacked the Nguyen Bao. The Tribune can't testify. He died early. In fact, a lot of Taglians died during the attack. But reinforcements kept turning up, which is why I believe Mogaba engineered the massacre. I knew nothing about it at first. I had located no listening posts outside our perimeter. I had no way of making sure my people would be secure out there. And where we bordered the Nguyen Bao community, there was no reason to doubt that we would receive ample warning. Tai Dei was, as always, nearby. I had gone to the top of an enfilading tower to stare at the nighted hills and brood. Would help ever come? Lately, no news at all came in from outside. Plenty of people wanted to leave. I could hear some of them out there now willing to take their chances with the Shadow Master. Fickle folk. A little hunger and stress, and they forgot all about liberty. What is that? Tai Dei astonished me by asking a whole question. I was amazed. I looked where he pointed. Looks like a fire. That is near Grandfather's house. I must go. More curious than suspicious, I said, I'll go with you. He started to argue, shrugged, told me, Do not suffer any spells. I can't care for you. So the Nguyen Bao knew about my blackouts and apparently suspected they were epileptic. Interesting. Tai Dei surely learned plenty just standing around with his ears flapping and his jaw tight shut. My guys hardly noticed him anymore. Nowhere was the water yet deeper than halfway to my knees. But it grabbed my feet when I tried to run. And Tai Dei was in a hurry. He was sure something was wrong. And he was correct. We ran through that alley where I had stumbled before and had plunged into hell. 
For a second I thought I had run from Dejigore into another nightmare. Taglian soldiers were dragging Nguyen Bao women and children and old people out of the buildings and throwing them to soldiers in the street. Those soldiers hacked and slashed. Their faces were distorted with the horror of their actions, but they were out of control, far past the point where they could stop. The flicker of firelight made everything seem more hellish and surreal. I had seen this before. I had seen my own brothers this way, a few times back in the north. The blood smell takes control and kills the mind and deadens the soul, and there's nothing human left. Taide howled a tortured cry and flung himself toward the building the Key family occupied, sword wheeling overhead. The place showed no obvious signs of having been invaded. I followed him, my own blade bare, unsure why, though I thought fleetingly of the woman Sara. Probably my actions were as thoughtless as those of the Taglians. Taglians got in our way. Tide engaged in some sort of bobbing, weaving dance. Two soldiers fell, their throats spurting. I beat another around with my sword, leaving him a collection of bruises and a lesson about dueling a guy a foot taller and fifty pounds heavier. Then there were Taglians everywhere, most paying no attention to us. I didn't have much trouble defending myself. Those people were smaller and weaker, and had a much shorter reach. And what I managed by brute power, Taide accomplished through maneuver. Hardly anyone was interested in us by the time we reached the speaker's door. I had guessed wrong before. Five or six Taglians had gotten inside. They just were not going to leave again. Not walking. Taide barked something in Yuang Bao. A voice replied. I took a wild swing at one last particularly stupid Taglian, spending the rest of the edge of my blade on his helmet. Then I shoved the door shut and barred it, and looked around for something to pile against it. Unfortunately, the keys were so poor, their best furniture consisted of ragged reed mats. A lamp's flame rose then another and another. For the first time, I saw the entire room the keys occupied. I saw the mauled corpses of several invaders. They had become focused on exploiting the beautiful woman before they finished everyone else. Kigota was still mutilating the Taglian corpses. But not all the corpses were Taglian. Not even the majority were Taglian. Only a small percentage were Taglian. Sara was holding her children to her chest, but neither would ever know fear again. Sara's eyes were empty. Taide made a sound like a kitten's whimper. He threw himself onto a woman. The woman lay face downward upon two little ones she'd attempted to shield with her body. Her effort hadn't been in vain. The youngest, less than a year old, was crying. No Taglian seemed inclined to try the door. I dropped to my knees where I had sat talking to the speaker so often. It appeared he and Hong Tre had watched death arrive and had engaged it in their places of honor. The old man was stretched out with his head and shoulders in Hong Trey's lap, but his lower body remained almost as it had been when he was seated. His wife slumped forward over him. The racket outside picked up. Tie day! Get your ass pulled together, man! What? The old woman was still breathing, making a raspy, bubbly sound. Gently, I lifted her. She was alive and even aware, her eyes unglazed. She seemed unsurprised to see me. She smiled. She managed to whisper despite the blood in her throat. 
Don't waste time on me. Take Sarah. Take the children. Her wound was a sword thrust that had gone in outside her right breast and downward through her lung. At her age, it was a miracle she had lived this long. She smiled again, whispered, Be good to her, standard bearer. I will, I promised, not understanding what she meant. Hong Tre managed a wink and a wince of pain. She leaned forward onto Kidam again. The racket outside increased again. Tai Day! I leapt over the bodies, flung a foot that glanced off Tai Day's behind. If you don't get your ass up and get organized, we're not going to help anybody. I spotted a couple more kids cowering in the back. One of them had lighted the lamps. Other than Sara and her mother, no adults appeared to have survived. Sara! I snapped. Get up! I slapped her. Round up those kids back there. They were too terrified to trust me, even if they knew me. I was still an outsider. A little yelling was all Tai Day and his sister needed. Their universe suddenly regained structure and direction, though they couldn't see it since. They just needed somebody to get them started. We found only one more living child and no more surviving adults. Tai Day, can you keep these kids together if we make a run for the alley? The Taglians would cease to be a problem if we made it that far. In there, one man could hold off a horde till help arrived. He shook his head. They are too frightened and too badly hurt. I was afraid of that. Then we'll carry them. Can you settle your mother down? She'll need to help. Sara, take the baby. I'll carry the girl. On my back, I want my hands free. Tell her to hang on tight, but to keep her hands out of my face. If she don't think she can do that, let me know now. We'll tie her wrists together. Sara nodded. She was past her hysteria. She knelt beside Hong Tre, held the old woman for a moment, then removed her jade bracelet. With a deep sigh and evident reluctance, she slipped the bracelet onto her own left wrist. Then she turned to Kigota and began trying to calm her. Taide talked to the children, translating my instructions. I realized that Sara never spoke at all not even in a whisper. The girl I was going to carry was about six years old, and she didn't want to go. Tie her on then, damn it! I snapped. I had begun to shake. I didn't know how much longer I would retain full control. We're running out of time! Only the baby was unhurt. A boy of about four looked like he wouldn't make it. He for sure wouldn't if I didn't get him to one eye in a hurry. Water splashed and a man shrieked right outside. A body slammed against the door which creaked and gave a little. Sara swatted the girl to calm her, fitted her onto my back. I asked, how about your mother? Never mind, the troll was with us now. She had a two-year-old of indeterminate sex riding her left hip and the business end of a broken spear clutched in her right hand. She was ready for taglions. Getting ready actually took less time than it requires to tell it. Sara carried the baby. Tide tied the wounded boy onto his back, kept his sword in hand. He and I went to the door. I peeked through cracks between the mutilated timbers. The Taglian soldier lurched past outside. I asked, You first, or me? One to lead one as rear guard. Me, from this day forward. 
What? Back, I snapped. But he glimpsed the hurtling shape at the same time. He slid to the right as I moved to the left of the doorway. We were out of the way when the door blew inward. We jumped at the intruder, recognized him barely in time. Uncle Doge! He was a lucky man. The weight of the children we carried had slowed us just enough to allow us time to see who had blown in. Go, I told Tai Day. We did not need to hold a conference. Tai Day encountered a pair of Taglians immediately. I jumped out and drove one away. Ki Gota wobbled out behind us. She stuck the tip of her spearhead into the throat of the nearest Taglian. Then she settled the child more comfortably on her hip, turned on the other soldier. A white crow swooped past, laughing like a troop of monkeys. The surviving Taglian was not a foolish young man. He headed for the nearest gang of his countrymen. Go, go! I barked at Tai Day. Gota, Sara, follow Tai Day. Uncle, where are you? We're going to leave your ass here. Uncle Doge stepped outside as the Taglian pointed us out to his comrades. Take the child away, standard bearer. Ashwand will be your shield. He put on an amazing display, though I glimpsed only a few furious moments. That funny little wide man took on the whole mob of Taglians and killed six of them in about as many seconds. The rest took off. Then we splashed into the alley. We reached safety moments later. In minutes, one eye was working on the wounded children, albeit not cheerfully. And I was deploying some of the old crew with Goblin for a limited counterattack. Chapter 72 that night was the final watershed. There was never any pretense of friendship with Mogaba again. I had no doubts myself that he would have come after us if the mistaken attack on the Nguang Bao had been a success. Fighting continued until the water got too deep. Despite insistence by one eye and others that protecting the Nguyen Bao was not our mission, I did salvage a third of the pilgrims, about 600 people. The cost of the attack to Mogaba was bitter. The following morning, most of the remaining Taglians found themselves in positions where they had to commit for or against Mogaba. The Taglians who had been with us from the beginning stuck with us. So did those who had deserted to join us. More came over from Ogaba's side now, but not a tenth as many as I expected. Tell the truth, I was disappointed. But Mogaba could make a hell of a speech to the troops when he wanted. It's that old time curse again, Goblin told me. Even now, they're more afraid of yesterday than they are of now and the water kept rising. I took the Nguyen Bao down into our warrens. Uncle Doge was amazed. We never suspected. Good. Then neither do our enemies, whose brilliance is eclipsed by yours. I brought the old crew inside, too. We packed people in as comfortably as we could. The warrens were quite spacious for sixty men. Adding six hundred young bao did cramp things some. We had to learn to recognize one another, too. My men had been trained to strike instantly at any unfamiliar face encountered underground. I went back outside after darkness fell. Taide and Uncle Doge dogged me. I assembled the Taglian officers who detached themselves to the old crew. I told them, I believe that we've done all we can here. I believe it's time to begin evacuating everyone who wants to get out of this hellhole. 
I didn't know why, but I was convinced that not much work would be required to evade or outwit the Shadowlander pickets ashore. I'll send one of my wizards to cover you. They didn't buy it. One captain wondered aloud if I intended to drive them into slavery so I could make it easier to feed my own men. I hadn't thought this through, hadn't considered possible difficulties. I'd forgotten that many of these men had attached themselves to us only because they believed that that was their best shot at staying alive. Never mind. If you guys want to stay and die with us, we'll be happy to have you. I was just trying to release you from your soldiers' oaths so you would have some chance. After Dark 2, we let the Yuang Bao men go back home to look for salvage and survivors and stores. They didn't find much. Mogaba's soldiers had been thorough in their own search, and the water had risen to cover everything. Mogaba's men, using makeshift boats and rafts, began attacking Jaikuri-occupied buildings one by one, harvesting stores forced out of hiding by the rising water. Mogaba had drowned his own supplies. Chapter 73 When I was sure nobody would notice, I pulled all my brothers inside. We bolted up and locked up and left Dejagore to its misery. We took the Nguyen Bao survivors with us. Excepting a few men who kept watch from lookouts, accessible only from inside, we withdrew into the deepest, most hidden parts of the Warrens, behind booby traps and secret doors and a web of confusion spells scattered by Goblin and One-Eye, who left only the occasional flicker of a doppelganger to mark our passing. I started out sharing my quarters with eight guests. After just a few hours, I told Uncle Doge, let's you and me take a walk. With all those Nguyen Bao down there, the air was stuffy and getting riper fast. Light was provided by candles so scattered you could get lost trekking from one to the next. Uncle Doge was close to being spooked. I hate it too, I told him. It keeps me riding the edge of a scream. But we'll manage. We lived this way for years once. No one can live like this. Not for long. The company did, though. It was a terrible place. It was called the Plain of Fear with good reason. It was filled with weird creatures, and every one of them would kill you in a blink. We were hunted constantly by armies led by wizards way worse than Shadow Spinner. But we gutted it out, and we came through it. Right here in these tunnels, you have five survivors who can tell you about it. The light was too bad to read him, though that was difficult in broad daylight. I told him, I'm going to go crazy if all of you stay with me. I need room. Nobody can get around without stepping on somebody right now. I understand, but I do not know how to help. We have empty rooms. Taide and his baby can have one. You could. Sarah could share one with her mother. He smiled. You are open and honest, but pay too little attention to Nguyen Bao ways. Many things happened the night you helped Taide rescue this family. I snorted. Some rescue. You saved all who could be saved. What a good boy am I. You had neither an obligation nor any cause of honor. In actuality, he used honor and obligation in lieu of Nguyen Bao concepts of similar but not identical meaning, which include overtones of free will participation in a divine machination. I did what seemed like the right thing. Indeed. Without any appeal or obligation. Which caused your current predicament. 
I must be missing something. Because you're not Yuan Bao, Tai De will not leave you now. He is the oldest male. He owes you six lives. His baby will not leave him. Sara will not leave because she must remain under her brother's protection until she marries. And as you can see, she may be a while getting through the horror. In this city, upon this pilgrimage, she never wanted to make. She has lost everything that ever meant anything to her, except her mother. A man might almost think the gods had it in for her. I said, then hoped that didn't sound too much like a wisecrack. One might. Standard bearer, the only good thing she recalls about that hell night is you. She will cling to you the way a desperate swimmer will cling to a rock in a rushing stream. It was time to be careful. A big part of me wished her clinging was more than metaphorical. How about Kigoda and those other kids? The children can be adopted into the families of their mothers. Gota surely can move. Dodge continued muttering under his breath, which was uncharacteristic. Sounded like something about wanting to move for a couple thousand miles. Though she will not take it well. Don't tell me you're less than enchanted with Kigoda, too. No one is enchanted with that ill-tempered lizard. And I once thought that you two were married. He stopped cold, stunned. You're mad! I changed my mind, didn't I? Hong Tre, old witch! What hast thou wished upon me? What? Talking to myself, standard bearer. Engaging in the debate I cannot lose. That woman Hong Tre, my mother's cousin, was a witch. She could see into the future sometimes. And if what she saw failed to please her, she wanted it changed. And she had some strange ideas about that. I trust you know what you're talking about. He didn't get it. Not entirely. The witch toyed with all our destinies, but never explained. Perhaps she was blind to her own fate. I let myself be distracted. What will your people do now? We will survive, standard bearer. Like you soldiers of darkness. That is what we do. If you really think you owe me for stumbling in there with Tai Day, tell me what that means. Soldiers of darkness. Stone soldier. Bone warrior, what do they mean? One might almost accept your protestations. Look at it this way. If I do know what you're talking about, you have nothing to lose by telling me what I already know. In that light, it was hard to tell, but I believe Uncle Doge smiled again. For the second time in one day. Clever, he said, and did not explain a thing. Chapter 74 Uncle Doge relieved me of most of my guests. I ended up sharing quarters with Tai Day and his son Totan, plus Sara. Sara helped me with the baby and struggled to put together meals, though the company kitchen could serve everyone in the Warrens. She needed to stay busy. Tai Day followed me almost everywhere. Both he and Sara were lethargic and uncommunicative, and added up to about half a human being between them. I began to worry. They belonged to a hardy people accustomed to surviving cruel disasters. They should show some signs of recovery. 
I assembled the brains of the outfit. Cletus, Loftus, Longinus, Goblin, and One-Eye, Otto, and Haga. I got some questions, troops. He gotta be here? Goblin meant Tyde. He's all right. Ignore him. What kind of questions? One I demanded. So far, we haven't had any major health problems in the company. But there's cholera and typhoid out there. Not to mention plenty of the old-fashioned drizzling shits. We all right? Goblin muttered something and passed gas loudly. Barbarian, one I sneered. We're all right because we follow Croker's health rules like they was religious laws. Only we can't make the rules stick much longer. We're almost out of fuel. And these Nguang Bao? They don't like to bother boiling water and keeping clean and not shitting where they live. We got them going along right now. But it ain't going to last. It's been overcast and nasty for a few days, I hear. Are we collecting any rainwater? Plenty for us, Loftus told me. But not enough for us and them, let alone getting any put back into the cisterns. I was afraid of that. About the fuel, I mean. You guys know any way to fix rice and beans so you can digest them without cooking them? Nobody knew. Longina suggested, maybe soaking them a long time in water might help. My mother did that. Damn, I really want us to get through this. But how? Goblin seemed to develop a small secret smile at that, like he had a definite idea. He exchanged glances with one eye. You guys got something? Not yet, Goblin told me. There's an experiment we still have to try. Get on with it. After the meeting, we need you to help. Wonderful. All right. Can anyone tell me what the rest of the city thinks about our disappearance? Hagop coughed, clearing his throat. He didn't say much ordinarily, so everybody paused to listen. I've been doing watches in the lookouts. Sometimes you can hear talk. I don't think we've done our reputation any good. Also, I don't think we fooled anybody. They don't talk about us much, but nobody figures we just cut out. They think we've found some way to dig a hole and fill it up with wine, women, and food, and pulled it in after us, and we ain't coming back out again till the rest of them are good and dead. Guys... I tried to get the wine, women, and banquets, but all I could come up with was the hole. Out of nowhere, Otto said, The water's going down. What? It is, Mergen. It's down five feet already. Would flooding the city make that much difference? No, why is that? Goblin and one I exchanged significant looks. What? I demanded. After we do our experiment. All right. The rest of you guys. You know the problems. Go see if there's anything we can do about them. Chapter 75 Talk to me, I told the runt wizards. Goblin said, We think something was done to you when you were out there. He jerked his head shoreward. What? Get serious. I... We are. You were gone a long time. And you changed. 
How many disappearing spells have you had since you got back? I gave it an honest think. Only one? Maybe. When I was kidnapped. I don't remember anything about it. I'm sure they drugged me. I was drinking tea with the speaker. Then I was in that street where you found me. I have no idea how I got there. I have vague recollections of smelling smoke and going out a door, which put me somewhere that I did not expect to be when I got to the other side. I vaguely remember thinking something about being in the house of pain. They tortured you. They did. I still had the Nixon bruises to prove it. I had no idea what I might have been asked, if anything. I did suspect that Sindhu's pals were behind my abduction and the attempt on Mogaba. If so, their life sure took an unpleasant turn when the Black Company found them. We've been watching you, Goblin said. And you have been behaving pretty strange sometimes. What we want to do is put you to sleep and see if we can't reach the part of you that was there when things happened. I don't get you. You don't have to. You just have to cooperate. You're sure? We're sure. He didn't sound sure. I awakened on my own pallet, not refreshed. Someone was wiping my hot face with a cold, wet cloth. I opened my eyes. In the light of one tiny candle, Sara looked more lovely than ever. She looked better than imagination. She continued to wipe my face. I had another hangover-type headache. What had they done? I ought at least to get the enjoyment that came before the pain. Totan began to fuss. He slept in a basket of evil-smelling rags beneath my writing table. I reached over and took his hand. He stopped crying, content to have human contact. He didn't cry for his mother much anymore. I raised my other hand to take Sara's. She pushed it back gently. She never spoke. I never did hear her speak, not even to her own children. I looked around. Tide was gone. Any more, it seemed, I had a better chance of shaking my shadow. Tide was there even in the dark. I started to sit up. Sara held me down with two fingers. I was too weak to do anything, and my head felt like it doubled in size just rising that foot. Sara offered me a hand-carved wooden cup filled with something that smelled so foul my eyes watered. Yuang Bao's swamp medicine. I drank. It tasted worse than it smelled. She continued to mop my face. I shivered and shook. The pain went away. I began to relax to feel both energetic and positive. That was good stuff. Maybe they made it smell and taste bad so people wouldn't take it all the time. We stared at one another a long time, saying nothing but reaching a decision our conscious minds did not entirely recognize at the moment. Hong Trey drifted across my thoughts with a smile and an admonition. This time I managed to smile when I sat up. Unchallenged. I have work to do. Sara shook her head. She fished under the table for Totan, dug him out of his basket. He was in desperate need of changing. Sara tugged my finger. I haven't done this in 20 years. 
Not since I was a kid myself and had baby brothers and sisters and cousins to change. Stop wiggling, you little turd. You ought to know the drill by now. Totan looked back at me with serious big eyes, not understanding my words, but catching my tone. We got him cleaned up and clothed again, in rags that would have embarrassed a beggar. I told Sara, I'll go kill somebody, get him something better to wear. She laid a hand lightly on my forearm, restraining me. That was a joke, hun. You hang around with me, you're going to hear some dark stuff. I don't mean it literally. I'm going to work now. I moved into the passageway slowly, my legs watery. Sara followed, Totan straddling her left hip. We ran into Bucket right away, looking groggy as he headed for his own pallet. I asked, You seen Goblin in one eye? They went upstairs with their magic junk. To the big lookout. Thanks. Before we walked five feet, Bucket called. Longo tell you the water is coming up in the catacombs? I sighed and shook my head. Listened to the half-hearted rumble of my stomach. Wondered if anybody had found a way to get some food cooked wound my way through the maze to the ladders that would take me up to Goblin and One-Eye. The light of day might do me good, if I had the strength to climb that far. I hadn't seen the sun for a long time. Chapter 76 I would not see the sun for a while longer. Sara handed Totan up through the trap door. He was asleep again. I guess you do sleep a lot when you're a baby starving to death. It was daytime, but a driving rain was falling. Hagop sat astride a chair, turned backwards, forearms on the chair's back, staring into the rain morosely. How long has this been going on? I asked. Day or three. We get any fresh water out of it? About as much as we can, being as we're hiding out. What are those two doing? Goblin and One Eye were on the floor in the middle of the room, cross legged, farthest from the moisture blowing inside. They didn't look up. Wizard stuff? Don't bother them. They'll bite your leg off. One eye grumbled. And somebody is gonna lose a set of ears if he don't stop yakking. Hagop and I each spent one of our diminishing supply of single-finger salutes. One eye didn't acknowledge the accolade. The lookout had a window facing each direction. I went to the biggest. This rain was not what we called a gully washer back home, but it was strong and steady. I could barely sense the vague loom of the surrounding hills. Nearer at hand, I could make out the surface of the water. It was down despite the rain. It was a gray that spoke of sickness. I saw a Jaikuri raft out there, so loaded with people that it was a wash. Men using short boards as paddles labored carefully to drive it toward shore. I made the rounds of the other windows, studied the city. I was pleased to see our Taglians at their posts the way they had been taught. They've been doing it by the numbers, Hagop agreed. And that gets them left alone. By Mogaba? By everybody. The fighting is almost constant. The streets and alleys were now canals. I saw bodies floating everywhere. The stench was overwhelming. The water level, though, was lower than I'd expected. I could see the citadel from the east window. There were gnar up top there, ignoring the weather. 
They moved around the parapet, studying our part of town. Hagop noticed me watching them. They're worried about us. They think we might come sort them out sometime. Sure we will. They're superstitious about guys like Goblin and One-Eye. Which shows you how dangerous a little ignorance can be. I heard that. One eye grumbled. He and Goblin could have been playing some obscure dice game for all I could tell. I liked it better when they conjured big lights that went around smashing things and burning them up. Destruction I can understand. Sara seemed tired of lugging Toton, so I took him. She offered a grateful smile. It lit up the lookout. One Eye and Goblin paused to exchange glances amongst themselves and with Hagop. What are you guys doing? I demanded. We found out we were right. Yeah? That might be a first. You were right about what? About your head having been tampered with. I shuddered to a sudden chill. That is not something anyone welcomes. Who did it? How? How we haven't been able to figure out for sure. It might have been managed several ways. Who and what are more interesting anyway. So give. Who was lady? And what was knowledge of the fact that she is out there? Excuse me? It's a little hard to tell from here, especially when we got tourists and their girlfriends traipsing through the workplace, but it looks like Lady and the Taglians are in charge out there. Their camp is on the other side of the hills, up the north road. The southerners we see patrolling are auxiliaries who report back to Lady. Run through that again? Goblin did so. I said, You guys go ahead. I'm just going to sit over here in the corner and think. Chapter 77 Uncle Doge and Tai Day were back from wherever they'd gone. They scowled at Sara and me when we returned, but neither said a word. Hong Trey still had her hold on the keys. Tai Day took his son. The little guy brightened immediately. Uncle Doge told me, My people are not mushroom standard bearer. They cannot endure this much longer. Your stone soldiers have been generous to a fault and have given no provocation. But even so, there will be trouble eventually. A wounded animal will strike out at even the most loving master. We'll be out of here sooner than I planned. I wasn't in a good mood. I wanted to drag Lady across my lap and paddle her. I've already given orders to start the process. You'll sound angry. I am angry. Lady used me in a political game with Mogaba with never a thought for the company's welfare. She was no more real company than he was. Longo leaned in the doorway. You get the word about the catacombs flooding Mergen? Bucket told me. How soon is it going to be a problem? Four or five days, maybe more, lest the leak gets a lot worse. We'll be gone. Your brothers and one eye are up in the big lookout. Go find out what's up. Longo shrugged and went, grumbling about the climb. I asked, who speaks for the Nguyen Bao now? We have not yet chosen, Uncle Doge replied. Could you? Quickly? 
a Taglian general named Lenore Bonharch. The guy who's in charge of the freed slaves and friendly Taglians in Daikuri right now is going to come by. We'll need somebody from Yuang Bao to join us in planning our evacuation. He started to say something. I rolled on. It seems that the Shadow Master isn't a problem anymore. Only nobody bothered to tell us. Our own so-called friends have been jobbing us for political reasons. We could leave any time. I don't know for how long now. I put all the blame for our ignorance on Goblin and One-Eye. You can blame a wizard for anything, and people will believe you. Sara tried to make a meal from what we had. I touched her hand as she passed. She smiled. I told her, This should be the last time we'll need to do this. I hoped. I was wrong. Everything takes time. Lanore Bonhart followed me down into the Warrens. He was both amazed and appalled. He was high caste Goonie. It was bad up top, but this squalor down below was beyond his imagination. We talked. Uncle Doge spoke for the Nguyen Bao. Bargains were struck, agreements agreed, plans quickly laid. Preparations began in earnest. Chapter 78 In the dark of night, in the rain, the black company stole forth, crossed a rickety makeshift bridge to stairs to the battlements, joined the Taglians of the Al Kul Company. With Goblin at the point, we sneaked along the wall, seized the North Gate and Barbican from the Narn their Taglians. Goblin's sleep spell made that easy. Nobody got hurt. In our gang. Before the last body splashed into the water outside, Goblin and I and the company cadre headed back to grab the West Gate and its barbican. With the gates in our hands, we could proceed unobserved by Mogaba's men. Loftus and his brothers got to work inside the central of the three towers between the gates. While the wall itself was stone, with a rubble fill, the towers were not solid. They had to be hollow to allow crossbowmen inside to pepper the wall faces with missiles. The boys got to work opening a hole to the outside from the floor nearest to the present water level. The Yuang Bao brought our remaining food stores to the surface. The women would use the last of the Taglian's fuel to cook for everyone. I wanted everybody to build strength. A lot of us were little more than stick figures now. When the sun rose next morning, the Nar atop the citadel saw nothing they had not seen the day before, except less rain. They got no signals from the north or west Barbicans, but didn't seem concerned. Aren't many crows around anymore, Goblin noted as daylight began to fade. Maybe we ate them all. Night returned. Everybody went back to work. The hammering and pounding and the collapse of masonry into water had to be audible all over town, but nobody could see what we were doing, and nothing was evident when the sun rose, except that several derelict buildings were missing. The lake continued its slow fall. The weather continued damp. The rafts the carpenters were building floated outside against the wall. Everything capable of offering flotation went into their construction, even the occasional empty beer barrel. That afternoon, we acquired some useful lumber when Mogaba sent three rafts to the north gate to find out why his signals weren't being answered. We could not keep the ambush from being seen from the citadel. Mogaba wasted no more men or materials. 
Loftus and his brothers said the best raft would be built long and thin so more people could paddle against less front-end water resistance. Working in three feet of water, the three brothers and a few skilled Taglians assembled one raft after another, each able to carry ten or more adults. By using everything they could find, they built forty-one craft. They guessed that fleet could carry seven hundred people, more than five hundred of whom could be put ashore while the rest brought the rafts back, reloaded them, and got under way again before dawn. So about twelve hundred could get away overnight, enough to establish a modestly solid beachhead on what we didn't know for certain would be a friendly shore. Problem. The numbers we needed to move undetected were greater than I'd guessed. I had my forty old crew, more than six hundred Nguyen Bao, and a whole lot more Taglians, freed slaves, and Jaikuri volunteers than I'd thought. Lanore Bonharge wanted to move nearly a thousand men in dependence. There was no way to get everyone out in one night. Here's what you do, one I said. You only take one load across the first night. Draw lots for the spots. That way we don't get people climbing over each other and nobody getting out in the panic. Figure the draw so a representative percentage goes from each group. Then nobody bitches. Dump the five hundred and some with orders to build a camp. Have the rafts come back and tie up, then finish up with two trips next night. The man's a genius, I said. You or a goblin will have to go, just in case. Shouldn't be necessary. Why not? Things aren't that dangerous anymore. Then we won't need to dig in. We can send the Nguyen Bao and dependents out first. That will go down great. Women and children and old people? That'll work. I'll bet you. Include the Taglian's dependents. Hold up on the Jaikuri, though, or we'll have the whole damned city lining up. We figure how many that all is, then draw lots for the rest of the positions. It worked out that thirty Taglians, five Black Company guys, and fifteen Yuang Bao warriors could be sent with the first group. We would have fifty swords on the beach. Uncle Doge grumbled about the scheme, because for one night he wouldn't be able to keep his whole tribe together. Clever, soldier of darkness. We were back to that. You hold us warriors hostage. You want to go, go. There are more of you than there are of us. Take the rafts. He scowled. His hand called. It's one night, Unc. And fifteen warriors will go with them. They'll be drawn by lot. So one of them might even be you. One Eye and Goblin didn't want to leave. I'm not going over tonight, one I told me. Me too, neither, Goblin insisted. They had that weasel look they get when they're dealing off the bottom of the deck. Why not? They looked like they could use a straight man. I didn't safe out there, one I told me after Goblin failed to convince me of his altruistic desire to protect the world by blunting Mogaba's wickedness. That bitch from Juniper. Lisa Dale Bowalk. She's laying for us out there. Who? I heard no bells ringing. Lisa Bowalk. From Juniper. Nasty little bitch. Ran with Maran Shed. The corpse runner. Shifter took her as his apprentice after the company went on the run. She was there when we scragged Shifter. 
The old man let her get away. Well, she's out there prowling, waiting for a chance to get even. She's already tried a couple times. And you never bothered to tell me. A healthy dose of skepticism is in order any time one eye waxes passionate on any subject. Wasn't no problem till now. Why argue? The truth seemed evident. Those two had plunder stashed and didn't want to leave it unguarded. Nor did either want the other left with it alone. I told them, Take your chances with the rest of us. Bonharge and Uncle Doge, Goblin and One-Eye, all glowered at me. I told them I shouldn't have to take a turn. One-Eye chuckled. Maybe not, but you said we all have to take our chances. I hadn't yet drawn. Trouble was the outcome was not in doubt. There was only one stone left in the jar. Five black pebbles had been allocated to the company, and only four had been drawn. I would go to the mainland with the first wave. Why did my bitty buddies look so smug? Pick your rock and pack your shit, Goblin said. They wouldn't have rigged the draw, would they? Nah. Not those two. Paragons of virtue, they were. Anybody want to buy this? I held up the expected black pebble. Stuff it, kid. One, I said. We'll manage without you. Again? What could go wrong in one day anyway? With you guys in charge? It didn't seem right, me going ashore before the last black company brother was out of the city. Just get your stuff together and go! Goblin snapped again. It'll be dark in an hour. It was still drizzling. Darkness would come early, though not early enough to complete two crossings and get the rafts back unseen. Damn it. Sara was burdened down with odds and ends and six pounds of rice and beans. I carried a pack containing a Nguyeng Bao tent, blankets, various clutter useful in the field, plus I had Totan perched on my hip. That kid was the least troublesome baby I ever saw. Tai Day had not drawn a blackstone. I meant to enjoy his absence. We climbed out of the warren, descended steps, crossed to the wall, climbed up, walked the battlements, descended inside the middle tower. And that was about as much exercise as I wanted. On my raft, we were all Nguyen Bao, except me and Red Rudy. The Nguyen Bao were patient about waiting their turns. The guys in the tower, operating by feeble lamplight, were patient too. Morale was good. Careful, Cleet said as I stepped aboard. I accepted children as he started handing them across. I picked you a good one, boss, but it'll lean over if you don't keep the weight balanced. Ma'am, he helped Sara. She acknowledged his courtesy with a dazzling smile. Thanks, Cleet. See you tomorrow night. Right. Round up some cattle and dancing girls. I'll check around. Kneel down. You gotta keep the center of gravity low so the damned thing don't tip. I glanced around. We were ready to go. Six Nguengbao men were aboard. They would paddle over. Five would bring the raft back. Other than them... Rudy and I and one gimp Nguyen Bao, about fifty, were the only adult males aboard. There were fifteen or sixteen kids and half as many women. We were crowded, but Nguyen Bao make a light load. I volunteered to help paddle, but the men on the job lost their capacity to understand Taglian. Rudy said, 
If they want to be dicks and bust their nuts, no sweat off our asses. You're right, but keep it down. We're doing a sneak here. It turned out that Yuang Bao were skilled boatmen, which should have been no surprise considering their origins. They remained as quiet as falling feathers and made rapid headway. The rafts immediately ahead had Taglian paddlers who not only made a lot of noise, they were slow. With just a whispered word, my paddler swung right and began passing. It wasn't much of a sneak overall. Paddles splashed, people bumped, grunted, banged around, and occasionally managed to collide with other rafts. But those were noises that came off the water every night, and tonight the drizzle was deadening some of the racket. And, of course, we were headed straight away from the city. The light inside the opened tower served as a navigational beacon. My paddlemen maybe didn't keep the best watch on the light. We drifted way offline and lost it altogether. Somebody hissed. Paddles stopped dipping. Even the murmur of the little ones stilled as mothers placed hands over their mouths or pulled lips to teats. I heard nothing. We waited. Sara rested her hand lightly upon my arm, sharing reassurance. Then I heard the clumsy paddling. Somebody was farther off course than we were. Only this raft was headed the other way. It was too early for that. The sounds grew louder. The other raft came abreast so close that it seemed they had to see us despite the darkness and rain. A voice said something softly, just a few words edged with anger, in the language of Gea's Lee. I had picked up maybe twenty words, none of which I recognized now. I didn't need to know words. I knew the voice. That was Mogaba. He hadn't been spotted leaving during the day. From the north and west Barbicans, it was possible to watch most of the lake surface, which meant that he'd been away at least since the previous night, which in turn would explain why there'd been no response to our capture of the Barbicans. What business could Mogaba possibly have over there? The Nar paddled on into darkness. We resumed our journey. I remained lost in thought till the raft ran aground and tossed me forward. Sara and I took up Totan and our burdens and marched ashore. The little guy was sleeping like his aunt's arms were a palace bed. In moments I discovered that my companions, although utterly ignorant of the Taglian language, expected me to be in charge on this side too. Uncle Doge's idea, no doubt, and, in effect, only till he arrived. Rudy, take charge of getting camp set. We had swung back into the general course of the fleet and had made landfall where others joined us in savoring the miracle of life outside Ejigore's walls. Hanging around in a rainstorm in the middle of the night didn't seem much of an improvement to me. Let's go, people. We can't just stand here. Start putting up those shelters. We had the tents the Nguyen Bao had carried on pilgrimage. We had blankets wrapped inside those same tents so they would stay dry. Somebody collect some brush and get some fires going. Maybe easier said than done in this weather. Babadou, take some men and set a perimeter. You, Joro, that your name, Sergeant? I was talking to one of the Taglian soldiers. Get patrols out. Come on, come on. We don't know that there aren't people over here who want to kill us. But it gets hard to care when you're cold and wet and tired. I was tired to the point of collapse, but I made myself an example. Sara followed and helped. While I barked at people, we took turns caring for the baby. 
I had visions of some major historical ass-kicker like Cromback the Terrible ordering his hordes about while he had a smelly baby tucked into the crook of his arm. Totan was a good kid, but he always needed changing. Soon everyone was bustling industriously. Shelters went up, brush got cut, small fires took life and spawned others, until there were enough to heat water to cook rice. The water we gathered using some tents to collect rain into the pots. It was going to be difficult for any of us to get wetter than we were already. We even sent several small loads of brush over to the city on returning rafts. Our friends might get to do a little cooking, too. Chapter 79 We'd known so much misery for so long. That night became just another sad chore. And in time, there was poor shelter, bad food, and feeble warmth for all. But by then it was getting light, and the rain was just an occasional sprinkle. Sara and Totan and I crept into our tent and bundled up. For a while, I was almost happy. That Totan was remarkable. He was almost as quiet as Sara most of the time, though he could get a good fuss going when he wanted. He was content to sleep right then. For the first time in a week, his tummy was full. Mine too. I got four hours of perfectly wonderful sleep before disaster interrupted. First, it took the shape of Kigota. I hadn't seen Sarah's mother since Uncle Doge cajoled her out of my quarters. I hadn't missed her either. Because I was asleep, I didn't witness the part where she ripped open the end of the tent. When I awoke, she was spitting and howling in a mix of Nguang Bao and really bad Taglian. Sara was sitting up already, her mouth open and tears starting. Totan began to cry. Kigota was not immune to baby tears. The soul of a granny did lurk behind all the ill temper, way behind. She said something to the toddler, gently. Rudy hurried up. You want I should throw this one back in the lake, Mergen? What? She crawled out of the water a while ago. Claimed somebody tried to murder her. Supposedly pushed her off the raft she was riding. Looks to me like maybe she asked for it. She probably did. Sara looked at me in surprise. Despite her tears. But I gotta be nice... She's almost family. Man, Rudy said. He walked off, shaking his head. Sara began gesturing exasperatedly at her mother. Totan stared at his granny, sucked his thumb. I caught a whiff. Go to Nana, I whispered. Show her how good you can walk. He didn't understand me, but she did and held her arms out. Near as I could tell, Totan was the only person in the world who cared for Kigota. He toddled, and his granny forgot all about being wet and cold and cranky. Sara looked at me hard. I shrugged, grinned, mouthed, he needs changing again. Rudy found me staring at the city, Fresh smoke hung over our part of town. Bubba Doo just ambushed a patrol, Mergen. Shit. When they don't report. He said they knew we were here. They were sneaking up. That swan character is with them. When I was right then. Anybody get hurt? Not yet. Good, good. Did they get a look at the camp? 
But Nguyen Bao had done a good job of camouflage, considering. You could tell where the camp was, but not its extent. I think they just saw the smoke. They were real surprised to get jumped, according to Bubba Doo. They see him? Yes. Unfortunate. Maybe they didn't recognize him. I shrugged. Some things can't be helped. I'll deal with them. Hang on. I stomped over to Sara and her mother. Hush! I snapped when the old woman opened her mouth to start. We have trouble. Who can speak for the Nguyen Bao? I didn't know who else to ask. These strange people did what I said when I told them, if that improved our situation, but they didn't talk. The old woman put the baby down and rose. She squinted. Her eyesight wasn't good. Tom Doc! She barked. A frail ancient turned. Despite his age, he was carrying a huge bundle of brushwood. Key Gota beckoned imperiously. The oldster headed our way at a high-speed shuffle. I went to meet him. Greetings, father. I am the one who dealt with the speaker. I spoke both loudly and slowly. I'm not deaf yet, boy. He replied in tagly and better than mine. And I know who you are. Good, then I'll get to the point. The soldiers over here have found us. We don't know what their attitude toward your people might be. If they're in a bad temper, I can't help much. Your warriors have scouted. Can you disappear? He looked at me for a dozen seconds. I looked back. Sara came to stand beside me. Behind us, Totan giggled as he played with his grandmother. The old man shifted his look to Sara. For a moment, he seemed to be staring into yesterday. He shivered. His expression grew more inscrutable. We can. Good. Do it while I'm with them. I jerked a thumb uphill. I'll get word to Doge. He'll find you. Tom Doc continued to stare coolly. Not inimically at all, just without comprehension. I wasn't behaving like a proper foreigner. Good luck. I returned to Rudy. Here's the deal. The Nguyen Bao need to take a powder. I'll go with Swan. I'll stall around when I get to his camp. You see that the Nguyen Bao get moved out. Then... Make this mess look like we were setting up for the guys coming over tonight. The old man overheard every word. I continued. As far as anybody around here goes, these people never existed. But do it. And let them have most of the food. We can sponge off ladies' gang. I hoped. Rudy looked at Sara. Everybody seemed to think that she was the key. He shrugged. You're the boss. I guess I don't need to understand. How are you going to explain her? I don't have to. I headed toward where Swan's patrol was surrounded. Sara came right along after pausing to grab up Totan. Stay here, I told her. She looked at me blankly, smitten by sudden deafness. I took a few steps. She matched them. You need to stay with your own people. A little smile teased her lips. She shook her head. Hong Tre was not the only witch in this family. Kigoda! Boom. You, soldier of darkness, you are ruin. Now is not good enough for you. 
cruel witch was my mother, but... She became incomprehensible, but not the least bit quiet. I checked Tom Duck. He remained inscrutable. But I would have bet my shot at heaven. He wanted to laugh. Fuck this. Rudy! Find out what belongs to Sara and see that it stays in our tent. Come on, woman. Chapter 80 Holy shit. Swan murmured when I stepped out where he could see me. No wonder you went back. Hands off, pretty boy. Ai, Nguyen Bao. If you're out there, go see Tam Dak. It's important. Taglians. See Rudy from the company. I turned back to Swan. There. We're down to a few snipers. Just in case. He stopped staring at Sara. Sorry. You really stumbled into the sweet shit, didn't you? He did have the courtesy to make his remarks in Forsberger. Yeah, I did. What's going on? I wake up the other day, after my wizards did an experiment on me, and I find out that somebody has been inside my head, messing with my memories. I find out I'm back over there in Hell's Kitchen hunting rats and fighting cannibals when all the time my so-called friends are sitting around out here, not even letting me know the Shadow Master is dead. Swan gave me a dumb look. But you knew that, Mergen. You was over here when we killed the bastard. You was here for a week after that. Killed him? It began to dawn. You didn't insist on going back? She said you... No, I didn't. When I found myself headed that way, I thought I was escaping from Shadow Spinner. I really believed that I hadn't gotten to you people. I think... It got more confused as I tried to figure it out. Somebody called out something in Yuang Bao. My troops hadn't followed orders. Someone else in Taglian called, Can you come up here, please, Mr. Morgan? I told Swan, I don't know what's up. You better stand fast. These guys are real touchy. I got nothing else to do with my life. I mean it. They're paranoid in a big way. If you'd spent the last several months in there, you'd understand. I clambered up a steep slope to where one taglion knelt in some scraggly brush with a Nguyen Bao about fifteen years old. The boy pointed, eager to be the first to deliver bad news. Fresh smoke rose from Dejigore. From, near as I could tell, the North Barbican, it looked like there was fighting there. A mob flash told me one eye or goblin was involved. Mogaba must be trying to recover the Barbican. I spied flickers around the west gate, too. Damned Mogaba. Thanks, guys. Nothing we can do about it, though. I hoped one eye and goblin carved Mogaba a new poop shoot. Get on back to camp, will you? There's stuff that's got to get done. Lady was gone. Blade was in charge and just sitting around collecting refugees from the city, keeping them from reporting back with news about Shadow Spinner. He admitted that. That's what she wants done. He seemed indifferent to Sarah unlike every other man in camp. She's lucky she's not here. I grumbled. I'd turn her over my knee. 
Since there was nothing else going on, I sat around with him and Swan and Mather until it started to get dark. Somebody found a puppy for Totan to play with. When it got late, I said, We'd better get back to our people. They'll be getting nervous. No can do, buddy, Mather told me. Blade agreed. She said no exceptions. The warmth went out of the air. I gave each one what I thought of as the Nguyen Bao look. Swan and Mather averted their eyes. Blade took it, but with a twitch. Sara seemed untroubled. I suppose after the Jigore, it was hard to imagine a turn for the worse. She even smiled. I assume the prison pen is where I left it. I remembered that part of my previous visit perfectly. We will keep you more comfortably, Blade promised. Mather volunteered. I'll show you where to bunk. We were far enough away not to overhear, Swan thought. He told Blade, You look at her good. That's one spooky woman. I glanced at Sara. I assumed she heard too. But her expression told me nothing. If Blade answered Swan, he spoke more softly. I continued to study Sara, wondering what Swan had seen. Chapter 81 The tent was decent. It must have belonged to a middle-grade Shadowlander officer. We were not unhonored guests, and the tent came with a man assigned to make us comfortable and bring us our supper. Blade's troops were foraging successfully, it seemed. I ate better than I had for a long time. What I want more than anything in the world, I told our man, whose name I never learned, is a bath. Sara hit him with a smile guaranteed to melt armor plate. She was enthusiastic about that idea. I'm so filthy my fleas have lice, I said. Must have been a real ration of guilt going around at high levels. An hour later, several soldiers showed up humping a looted stone horse trough. With them came guys lugging buckets of hot water. I told Sara, we must have died and come back as princes. Our tent was big enough to contain the trough and water with room left over. Swan turned up. What do you think of that, eh? If I didn't have friends over there fighting and dying, I'd ask for a life sentence. Take it easy, Mergen. It'll all work out. I know that, Swan. I know that. But some of us aren't going to be happy how it does. Yeah, well, good night. It was. Beginning with the bath, Sarah made it clear her definition of our relationship was exactly what others feared or suspected. She astounded me with her ability to communicate without spoken words, amazed me that in the midst of such unrelenting hell, a flower of such beauty could bloom and defy the night. I slept longer and better than I had for months. Maybe some part of me just resigned and let go. Water in the face wakened me. What? I cracked an eyelid and popped upright. Sara sat up as I did. Totan, what are you doing, kiddo? The little guy was leaning over the edge of the horse trough, spanking the water. He looked at me and grinned, said something in Nguyen Bao baby talk that sounded like Dada. da 
What's going on? Sara shrugged. Totan said Dada again and headed out of the tent. Things were happening outside. I grabbed my clothes, climbed in, stuck my head outside. Holy shit. Where the freak did you guys come from? Ty Day and Uncle Doge were seated outside. Their swords lay across their laps, sheathed, thankfully. Gangs of Taglians were coming by to check them out. I guessed they hadn't been there long, nor had they asked permission to enter camp and assume their posts. Swan and Mather appeared. Uncle Doge told me. Only one group made it out again last night. The black men attacked. Many men were injured. Numerous rafts were damaged. But their soldiers did not want to fight, and many asked to join Bonarge. Who the hell are these guys? Swan demanded. How did they get here? The rest of the family. I expect they sneaked. They're good at that. Obviously, your perimeter ain't what it should be. Blade shouted something from the distance. Crap, Swan grumbled. Now what? He jogged away. Mather considered Ty Day and Uncle Doge briefly, shrugged, followed Swan. Uncle Doge said something to Sarah. She nodded. I guess he wanted to know if she was all right. Totan climbed around on his father. Doge told me, You did well, and more than you were obliged, standard bearer. Our people are safely away, and these men know nothing about them. Yeah? Good. What about mine? They would not come out. The wizards want to pursue their vendetta with Mogaba. They might come tonight. Chapter 82 They did not come that night. Nor did they come the next, though they sent a lot of Taglians and Jaikuri out in place of the company. Two mornings later, Mather finally let me in on what the excitement had been about when Blade interrupted our discussion over Uncle Doge and Ty Day. He told me, Crocker will be here in an hour or two, Morgan. You might put in a good word. What? It was not an hour, and it was not just the old man. Croker was traveling with the Prabrindra Dra himself. He looked like he'd seen a lot of hard road. I moved toward him in fits and starts, unsure where we stood after all this time. He jumped down, said, it is me. I'm real. But I saw you die. No, you saw me get hit. I was still breathing when you cut out. Yeah? The shape you was in, there wasn't no way. Shouldn't have been either. It's a long story. We can chew in it over a few beers sometime. He waved. A soldier trotted up. Croker grabbed his spear, which was almost long enough to be a pike, shoved it at me. Here. You left this when you ran off to play Widowmaker. I didn't believe it. Not at first. It was the lance for the standard. You really need to hug it? It's really it? I was almost sure it was lost. Despite what I had told Mogaba, you got no idea how guilty I felt. Although I did think I saw it that one time, it's really you? I looked at him closely. Having seen what illusions one eye and goblin could conjure, 
I wasn't quite ready to accept the evidence of my own eyes. It's me. Really. Alive and in a mood to kick some ass. But that's not what I've got on my mind right now. Where's Lady? Poor boy. Blade gave him the bad news. His paramour had left more than a week ago. Headed north. They missed each other on the road. Swan and Mather were impressed by the presence of the prince, their supposed boss. Why was he out running around anyway? I noticed Croker had a hard stare for Sindhu, who'd stayed behind when Lady left. The old man snapped. Quit making love to that damned thing, Mergen. I need to catch up. I'm way out of touch. Will somebody take this damned butt cruncher? A soldier grabbed his mount's reins. Let's get out of the sun. I want to hear your story, I said, while it's fresh. Going to put it into the annals? You've been keeping them up? I tried, only I had to leave them in the city. I didn't like that either. One eye could promise the moon about taking care of them, but would he deliver? I'll look forward to reading the Book of Mergen. If it's any good, you've got the job for life. Swan said something about Lady planning to write a book of her own when she got time. Croker flung a stone at a crow. It was the first of those birds I'd spotted since the albino in the night. Maybe he brought it with him. I sketched some of what had been happening in Dejigore. Guess it hasn't been fun for anybody. Seems Mogaba is the main problem. Better get right after him. How many people are still over there? My guess is him and the Nar have a thousand to fifteen hundred men. I don't know how many people I have. Some come out every night, but since I got elected prisoner here, I can't keep track. Goblin and one eye and most of the company are still over there. I hoped Uncle Doge and Tai Day were using this distraction to get Totan and Sara and themselves on the road. Why would they stay? They don't want to leave. They say they want to wait till Lady gets all her powers back. They say something is out here waiting for them. Powers back. It's happening, Blade said. Huh. So what are they afraid of, Mergen? Shapeshifter's apprentice? That bitch from Juniper? She almost got one eye once already. How come I believed the little rat now, but hadn't when he'd told me? I had a momentary vision of one eye puffing through the night with fanged death closing in. It was as solid as actual memory. I remember her. She was a real piece of work. Marin Shedd should have taken care of her when he had the chance. Evidently, she wants to get even with us for doing shifter. She may be locked into the four Velaka shape, too. Which would really piss anybody off, I guess. But if you was to ask my personal opinion, I think she's only an excuse. They want to stay where they are because otherwise they might have to leave something behind. Like what? I shrugged. They're goblin in one eye. They've had months to pilfer and profiteer. Tell me about Mogaba. Now we got down to the grim stuff. Before the discussion ended, even nasty Sindhu condemned the Nar. I'll put an end to that. You want to take a message to Mogaba? I looked over my shoulder. He couldn't be asking the guy behind me. There was nobody there. You shitting me? 
Not unless it's an order. And maybe not then. Mogaba wants my head. Not to mention my heart and liver for breakfast. Crazy as he is right now, he might go after me with you standing right behind me. I'll get somebody else. Good idea. I'll go. Swan volunteered. Then him and Mather got into an argument about that. Evidently, Swan had something to prove to himself, and Cordy did not believe he needed to bother. Chapter 83 My status in camp changed sharply. Suddenly, I never was a prisoner. Never had been unfree to do whatever served the common good. Only problem was, my tent was cold. All I had left of Sara and the Nguyen Bao was the jade amulet Sara had taken from Hong Tre before we had carried the children out of the killing place. You done yet? Croker demanded, finding me seated in front of my tent, working on the standard. I showed him what I was doing. Good enough? Perfect! You ready? Ready as I'll ever get. I touched the jade amulet. She pretty special. Very special. I want to hear all about her people. Someday. We walked through the hills and down to the shore. A sizable boat was out on the lake already. Blade's soldiers had transported it over land after having failed to work it along the canal from the nearest river to the lake. Croker and I took up position on a prominent hummock. I displayed the standard. They would be able to see that from the city, even if they didn't recognize me and the old man. Mogaba wanted to know where the standard was. He could see for himself now. While the boat crossed over and returned, Croker and I speculated as to what made both Mogaba and Lady want to be in charge so badly. Looks like Swan is getting results. Can you see what's going on? Looks like somebody black getting into the boat. That somebody turned out to be Sindawe. I told the old man, this guy was always as right with us as having Mogaba for a boss would allow. Ochiba and Icy and some of the others weren't too bad either. But they wouldn't disobey orders. Sindawe stepped ashore. Croker saluted him. He responded uncertainly. Looked to me for a clue. I shrugged. He was on his own. I had no idea where this was headed. Sindawe made sure he was face to face with the real captain. Once he was satisfied, he suggested, Let us step out of sight and talk. The old man made a small gesture that told me I should let them talk in complete privacy. They walked around behind the hummock and sat on a rock. They talked for a long time, voices never rising. Sindawe finally rose and walked back to the boat like a man borne down by an incredibly heavy burden. What's the story? I asked Croker. He looks like he suddenly added twenty years on top of the wear and tear of the siege. Years of the heart, Mergen. Feeling morally compelled to betray somebody who's been your best friend since childhood will do that to you. What? He would say nothing more. We're going over there. I'm going to meet Mogaba nose to nose. I thought of a pile of arguments against. I didn't bother. He wouldn't listen. Not me. I shuddered. My spine was shivering to that chill they say happens when somebody walks over your grave. Croker looked at me hard. I drove the butt of the standard into the earth vigorously, meaning, here I stand. He grunted, turned, and went down to the boat. 
the creature Sindhu snaked out of nowhere and joined the party. I wondered how much of Sindawe's and Croker's conversation he'd overheard. Not a word, probably. The old man would have used the Jewel City's dialect. Once the boat was well out onto the water, I sat down beside the standard, clung to the pole and tried to figure out what made it impossible for me to go back over there. Chapter 84 I had suffered no big seizures for a while. I was not on guard anymore. This one began insidiously, like just losing focus and drifting into a lazy daydream. I stared at Dejigore, but no longer really saw it. Thought of the women who'd entered my life and the ancient one who'd left it. Already I missed Sara and so serious Totan. A white crow landed on the crossbar of the standard, called down at me. I paid no attention. I stood at the edge of a shimmering wheat field. A twisted, broken black stump rose thirty yards from me in the field center. Bickering crows surrounded it. The fairy towers of Overlook gleamed in the distance, days walk away. I recognized them for what they were, without understanding how I could know. Suddenly the crows rose up and wheeled around, flew that direction in an uncrow-like flock. One white crow stayed behind, circling. The stump shimmered darkly. A glamour faded away. A woman stood there. She looked very much like Lady, but was even more beautiful. She seemed to look right through me, or at and into me. She smiled wickedly, playfully, seductively, perhaps insanely. In a moment, the albino bird settled onto her shoulder. You are impossible. Her smile shattered into shards of laughter. Unless I was completely, inescapably mad, there was only one person this could be. And she died long before I ever joined the company. Soul Catcher. Croker was there when she went down. Soul Catcher. That would explain a lot. That would illuminate a hundred mysteries. But how could that be? A huge black beast that looked something like an ebony tiger padded past me from behind, went and settled on its haunches near the woman. There was nothing servile in its manner. I was frightened. If Soulcatcher was alive, and in this end of the world, and inclined to meddle, she could become the greatest terror around. She was more powerful than Long Shadow, Howler, or Lady. But, unless she'd changed since the old days, she preferred to use her talents in small ways for spite, or her own amusement. She winked at me. Then she spun around and just seemed to disappear, leaving more laughter rippling in the air behind her. Her laughter became the mirth of the white crow. The four Velaka became bored with the show, went off into the distance. And I... Faded. Chapter 85 A crow called overhead. A hand shook my shoulder, not gently. Are you all right, sir? Is there a problem? What? I was seated on a stone step, clinging to the edge of a massive wooden door, 
an albino crow paced back and forth on the door's top edge. The man who held my shoulder tried to shoo the bird with his free hand and some pithy curses. He was huge and hairy. It was the middle of the night. What light there was came from a lantern the man had set upon the cobblestones. It set eyes glowing across the street at a low level. For an instant I thought I saw something huge and cat-like slipping past. The man was one of the Shadar patrolmen the Liberator had employed to roam the streets after dark, maintaining order and keeping a watch for outsiders of dubious provenance. Laughter came from the darkness across the way. The patrolman wasn't doing a good job. I was supposed to be one of the good guys here. She was one of the dubious strangers. I was in Taglios. I smelled the smoke. The lantern? No. The odor came from the stairwell behind me. I recalled dropping a lamp, recalled a confused cacophony of where's and when's. I'm all right. Just had a dizzy spell. Laughter from across the street. The Shadar glanced back, but otherwise seemed indifferent. He didn't want to believe my story. He wanted to find something wrong right here, right now. He didn't like foreigners, and us northerners were all madmen and drunks. But unfortunately, we were also very much in favor with the palace. I got up. I had to get moving. My mind was clearing. The truth was coming back. I had a desperate need to get to the old familiar entrance to the palace because I had to get to my apartment in a hurry. The moon suddenly splashed its light down into the street. It had to be past midnight. I saw the woman, watching from across the way. I started to say something to the Shadar, but a sharp whistle came from the distance in the direction the monster had seemed to be moving. Another patrolman needed assistance. He said, Take care, foreigner. He jogged away. I ran too, not pausing to take the elementary step of closing the sally door. I reached my customary entrance. Something was wrong. Cordy Mather's guards should have been on duty there. I was unarmed except for a belt knife. I drew it, pretending I was a fierce commando. There was no way Mather's gang would leave an entrance uncovered. You couldn't bribe those guys to screw up. I found the sentries in the guard room. They'd been strangled. No need to question the prisoner further now. But who was the target? The old man? Almost certainly. The Radisha? Probably. And anyone else important that they could get. I fought panic. Managed to keep from herring off blindly. Ty Day and Uncle Doge were up there anyway. I stripped the shirt off one dead guard, wrapped my throat. That should afford some protection against the strangler's scarf. Then I bounded upstairs like a mountain goat who was long out of practice. I reached my own floor so winded I had to lean against the stairwell wall and strain to keep from puking. My legs were jelly. Alarms banged everywhere now. It was happening as I stood there. I got some wind back, left the stairwell for the corridor, and tripped over a dead man. He was filthy and undernourished. A blade had laid him open from left shoulder to right hip. His right hand lay ten feet away. It still clutched a black rummel. There was blood everywhere. Some still seeped from the corpse. I stared at the scarf. The dead man had murdered many times. Now Kina had betrayed him. Such treachery is one of the goddess's more endearing qualities. Only Ashwand 
could cut that clean and deep. Another corpse lay near my apartment door. A third lay in the doorway itself, holding the door open. All the blood was fresh. The corpses still bled. As yet, few flies were in evidence. Knowing I did not want to do so, I entered my quarters, ready to sink bare teeth into anything that moved. I smelled something. I spun and stabbed as someone skinny and brown and unwashed flew at me, hit me, threw me backwards. A black rummel spun around my neck, but failed its function because of the shirt wrapping. I hurtled backward into my work table. There was a sharp pain in the back of my head. Inside I screamed, Not again! Darkness closed down. Pain awakened me. My arm was on fire. My crash into the table had overturned a lamp. My papers, my annals were burning. I was burning. I leaped up shrieking, beating my arm, and when I had that extinguished, I began jumping around, trying to save the papers. I saw nothing else and thought of nothing else. This was my life going up in smoke. And beyond the smoke, there was only the house of pain. Only the bleak seasons. Way, way over there, like down a long, cruel tunnel, I saw Uncle Doge kneeling beside Tai Day. Between them and me lay three dead men. The floor was invisible beneath their blood. Two of the dead showed Ashwan's characteristic precision cuts. The other had fallen to a cross-cut that betrayed a hint of raggedness. The swordsman had been in the grip of an uncontrolled rage. Uncle Doge held Tai Day's head against his chest. Tai Day's left arm hung as though broken. His right surrounded To Tan on his lap. The five-year-old's head was tilted at a bizarre angle. Tai Day's face was pale. His mind was not in this world. Uncle Doge Rose came toward me, stared into my eyes, shook his head, then stepped close and wrapped powerful arms around me. They were too many and too fast. I collapsed. This was the present. This was today. This was the new hell where I did not want to be. Fragments, just blackened fragments crumbling between my fingers. Browned page corners that reveal half a dozen words in a crabbed hand. Their context no longer known. All that remains of two volumes of annals. A thousand hours of labor. Four years of history. Gone forever. Uncle Doge wants something. He's going to make me drink some strange Nguyen Bao filter. Fragments. All around. Fragments of... My work, my life, my love, and my pain, scattered in this bleak season. Darkness. And in the darkness, shards of time. Hey there! Welcome to the City of the Dead! Chapter 86 the apartment was overrun with guards. What was going on? I was confused. Another fainting spell. Smoke. Blood. The present. The hard present that breathed pain like a dragon breathes fire. I became aware of the captain's presence. He came from the back of the apartment, shaking his head. He eyed Uncle Doge curiously. Cordy Mather blew in. 
looking like a man encountering the worst horror show of a long and unhappy lifetime. He went straight to the old man. I heard only dead men all over the place. I couldn't catch Kroger's response. We're after you. Croker shrugged. You just moved out, Lust. A guard rushed in. He whispered to Mather. Mather barked. Listen up! We've still got some live ones out there. Be careful! He and the old man moved a little closer. They're lost in the labyrinth. We'll need one eye to find them all. The excitement never ends, does it? Croker sounded really tired. To no one special, Uncle Doge announced, They have only just begun to pay. His taglion was excellent, considering he'd been unable to speak a word the day before. Mother Goda came from the back, bent and moving slowly. Typically of Nguyenbao women dealing with disaster, she'd brewed tea. This was quite possibly the worst day of her life. It would be a good pot. The captain gave Uncle Doge another searching look, then knelt beside me. What happened here, Mergen? I'm not sure. I walked in, in the middle of it, Stabbed a guy, that one. Got thrown across a table. Tripped and fell through a hole in time. Maybe. Woke up on fire. I still had charred pages around me. My arm hurt like hell. There were dead people all over. I lost it. Next thing I knew, it was now. Croker caught Mather's eye. He used a rocking motion of his right hand to indicate Uncle Doge. Cordy Mather asked Uncle for his story. He spoke perfect Nguyen Bao. It was a night of a thousand surprises. Uncle Doge said, These deceivers were skilled. They gave no warning. I weakened just an instant before two fell upon me. He explained how he had evaded death, breaking a neck and a spine in the process. He described his kills clinically, even critically. He spoke harshly of both himself and Tai Day. He was down on himself because he'd allowed himself to be tempted into pursuing other deceivers when they fled. Their flight proved to be a diversion. Tai Dei, who hadn't been drawn away, received criticism for showing the instant of hesitation that had cost him his broken arm. Cheap lesson for him, Croker observed. Uncle Doge nodded, missing the captain's sarcasm. He had to face the cruel cost of having allowed himself to be deceived. There were fourteen corpses in my apartment, not including those of butchered annals. Twelve had been deceivers. One had been my wife, and one my nephew. Six perished by Ashwand, three at Tai Day's hands. Mother Gota gutted two, and I pigstuck one when I walked in. Grasping my shoulder in what was meant to be a comforting gesture, Uncle Doge said, A warrior does not slay women or children. That is the work of beasts. When beasts kill men, all men are constrained to hunt and destroy them. Nice talk, Croker said. But the deceivers never claimed to be warriors. He wasn't impressed by Uncle's speech. Neither was Mather. It's religion, old-timer. Their path. They're the priests of death. The sex or age of their sacrifices doesn't mean squat. 
our victims all go straight to paradise. I never have to take another turn around on the wheel of life. No matter how boogered up their karma was. Uncle Doge's mood grew blacker by the minute. I know, Tuga, he muttered. No more Tuga. Nobody was revealing any mysteries to him. Cordy smiled wickedly at the swordmaster. You guys probably won a high spot on the desirable victim list by killing so many of them. If you're a deceiver, there's big status to be gained by killing somebody who has killed a lot of people. I heard Mathers blather, but it didn't register a sense. I muttered, Tuga ain't no crazier than any other religion around here. That seemed to offend everyone equally. Good. Mather turned to fuss at his guards. They'd failed their trust. My own disaster was just one of several. Others were still happening. Numbly, I said, You can't defend against this kind of thing, Mather. These guys weren't commandos. I swatted the nearest corpse with the charred sheets I was holding. They came in here expecting to make it to paradise by midnight. Probably didn't even have an escape plan. In a softer voice, I said, Captain, you might better check on smoke. Croker frowned like I'd given away everything, but asked only, You need anything? Want somebody to stay? He understood what sorry meant to me. This is where I came from. When I kept falling back. I got family with me, Captain. If I start to go bug fucking the head, they'll cool me down. You really want to help? Fix Ty Day's arm. Then go do what you gotta do. Croker nodded. He made a small gesture that in normal times meant go, but which meant a good deal more now. Narayan Singh is going to wake up some morning and realize that he has reaped the whirlwind. There's no safe place for him anymore. I rose. Grimly, I set out for my bedroom. Behind me, Ty Day groaned as Croker set his arm. The old man paid him no other mind. He was busy issuing orders that meant a major intensification of the war. Uncle Doge followed me. The reality hurt less than the anticipation had. I indulged in the pointless gesture of removing the rummel from my wife's throat. I stood there with the scarf dangling, staring. The strangler must have been a true master. Her neck was not broken, nor had her throat been bruised. She looked like she was sleeping. There was no pulse when I touched her, though. Uncle Doge, can I be alone? Of course, but drink this first. It will help you to rest. He handed me something that smelled really nasty. Did we do this already? He went away. I laid down beside Sari for the last time. I held her while the medicine began to course through me, calling forth sleep. I thought all the usual thoughts, nurtured the usual hatreds. I thought the unthinkable that it might be best that this had happened before Sarah learned what it really meant to be company. I reminisced the great miracle. Ours was a match that never should have been, a match neither ever regretted for an instant, yet one created by a force so slight as the unspoken whim of an old woman cursed with hysterical, unreliable, precognitive visions. 
I thought, both sanely and crazily, and commenced the process of beatification that is inevitable after any untimely death. I slept, but even in nod, I couldn't escape the pain. I dreamed cruel dreams I couldn't reclaim when I awakened. It was almost as if Kina herself were mocking me, telling me that triumph was a costly deception. Sari was gone when I awakened, my head throbbing with a medicinal hangover. I stumbled around until I ran into Mother Gota. The old woman was fussing over some tea and talking to herself exactly the way she talked to the rest of the world. Where's Sara? I asked. Tea, please. What happened to her? Gota looked at me like I was mad. She's dead. No pulling punches for her. I know that. Her body is gone. They have taken her home. What? Who? Anger began to rise within me. How dare they? Who was they? Doge, Tai Dei, her cousins and uncles. They have taken Sarah and Totan home. I am here to watch over you. She was my wife. I... She was Nguyen Bao before she was your wife. She is Nguyen Bao now. She will be Nguyen Bao tomorrow. Hong Trey's fantasies cannot change that. I gained control before I exploded completely. Gota was right. From a Nguyen Bao point of view. Also... There wasn't a lot I could do about it right now. Not without coming up with a lot more ambition than I had this morning. All I really wanted to do was sit around feeling sorry for myself. I went back to our room with my tea. I settled on our bed, picked up the jade amulet that had belonged to Hong Tre. It seemed very warm this morning, more alive than I. They hadn't worn it for a long time. I slipped it onto my wrist now. I could work my anger out on Uncle Doge when he got back. If he came. Chapter 87 Not one strangler attack team achieved its tactical objective. But even so, their raid was successful psychologically. It stunned the city. It shocked the leadership. It generated terror out of all proportion to actual damages. Croker grabbed it and turned it around. Next morning, while most of us were still wrestling with our emotions... He went to the Taglian mob and spoke in his old guise as liberator. He announced a new and furious era of total, relentless warfare against the Shadow Master and Tuga, although he divulged few real facts about the palace raid. That set rumor running wild through the alleys and byways and fueled fresh anger. For years the war had been a long way away, in the old Shadowland, and so had become emotionally remote to most of the people. The Deceiver raid brought the war back home. The old enthusiasm resurfaced. The Liberator told the crowd that the years of preparation were over. It was time to carry justice to the wicked. But moving immediately meant a winter campaign. I asked the old man if he really intended that. Damn straight, more or less. They have their feet up down there. You know that. You've been riding smoke. 
I mean, who would be crazy enough to take a crack at the Don de Presh when the snow is flying? Who indeed? It'll mean some major hardships for the soldiers. If an old fart like me can take it, they can all take it. Right. Only some of us can take it better than others. Some of us are obsessed. Hell. Us black company guys have obsessions and hatreds enough for everybody. Work became my all. I was past the evil time. No longer did I fall back into cruel yesterdays in order to escape crueler todays that I could detect. But I did not sleep well. Hell still lurked beyond sleep's wall. I lost myself in the annals, re-recording everything the fire had claimed. I ran away by riding smoke out into the past, where and when I could, to check my recollections. One Eye's arsenal increased its production. The old man drove the ruling class crazy, trying to get money to pay for everything. Word of the new stage spread through the Taglian territories as fast as horses could run. Lady began gathering her forces and training them to deal with the darknesses that had given the Shadow Masters their name. I became aware that Goblin had dropped out of sight, completely, but that only weeks after the actual event. I feared that he'd been murdered. But Croker didn't seem concerned. One Eye was fussed. He was desperate to get his sidekick connected with my mother-in-law. But he could not unearth a trace of the little toad. In the night, when the wind no longer licks through its unglazed windows nor prances along its untenanted halls, nor whispers to its million creeping shadows. The fortress is filled with the silence of stone. Cold, cruel dreams stir within the figure pinned to the throne so ancient that bits have given up to dry rot. A gleam from beyond flickers, the figure sighs, drawing in the light, exhaling a balloon of dream that somehow finds its way through the tortuous passages of the fastness and out into the world in search of a receptive mind. Upon the plane itself, the shadows swirl like minnows, sensing the passing of a huge predator. The stars wink down in cold irony. There is always a way. Chapter 88 House of Pain Mocking Laughter She is beautiful. Yes, almost as beautiful as I. But she is not for you. The woman tucked a child in for the night. Her slightest movement bespoke grace. I. There was an I suddenly. No, not for you. She is mine. Nothing is yours but what I give you. And I give you pain. This is the house of pain. No, whatever you are, go. Chapter 89 Ouch! I opened my eyes. Uncle Doge and Tai Day crouched beside me, one to either side looking concerned. I rolled my head, surprised to see them back so soon. I was on the floor in my workroom, but I was dressed for bed. What am I doing here? You walked in your sleep. Doge told me. Also talked, which alerted us. Talked. I never talk in my sleep. But I do not walk in my sleep either. 
God damn it. I was having another spell. And this time I remembered. Some. I have to get this down right now before I lose it. I scrambled across the room in moments I was scratching away. And when I was done, I realized I didn't have a clue about anything. I threw my pen down. Mother Goto appeared. She carried a pot of tea. She poured for me, then for Doge and Tai Day. Sara's death had hurt her deeply. For the moment, her normal, contentious character was submerged. She was an automaton. This had been going on for days. What is the trouble? Uncle Doge asked. There's nothing there. I remembered perfectly but can't find a clue toward an explanation. Then you must relax. Stop fighting yourself. Tai Day, get the practice sorts. I wanted to scream that this was not the time, but this was his answer to all stress. Come to the swords. Pursue the exercise rituals. Parade the stances. To do it right required total concentration. And it always worked, no matter how much I disbelieved. Even Gota joined us, though she was less adept than I. Chapter 90 The night that I'd tried to find my way back from Smoke's hideout, I'd wondered if one I had cast some confusion spells around there. I learned that he had, and had scattered random pockets of confusion all through the disused parts of the palace, so the one critical area wouldn't stand out. He gave me an amulet of charmed woolen strings, Several colors twisted together that I was supposed to wear on my wrist. It would let me pass through the spells no more confused than my usual state. Be careful, he told me. I change these spells every day now that you're working smoke regular. I don't want nobody stumbling in there while you're out of body. Especially not the radisha. That made sense. There was no calculating smoke's value. No instrument for espionage this valuable had ever existed before. We did not dare risk compromising him. The old man gave me a list of regular checks he wanted made. These included keeping a close watch on Blade. He didn't use that information immediately, though. I supposed he was laying back, letting Blade gain confidence, and occasionally letting Blade deal with our religious problem children for us, too. I didn't ask, but I'm sure the policy was coolly deliberate. The priesthoods provided our main political challenges. It made sense to me, too, to use them up, keeping Blade from getting too strong. I had my personal list of investigations, too. Some meant to satisfy my own curiosity. Most to get straight events that needed to be recorded in the annals. I spent about ten hours a day just working on the books. I rise, write, eat, write, visit smoke, write, sleep for a little while, then get up and do it all again. I don't sleep long or well because I don't care to tarry in the house of pain. Uncle Doge has decided not to return to his swamp. Likewise, Mother Gota. They stay out of my way, mostly. But they're always here. Always watching. They have expectations. The new phase of the war is here. They've decided to play a part. They mean the cruelty of the deceivers to be requited by the cruelty of the Yuang Bao. 
One of the big problems of espionage I've discovered is figuring out where to look for the information you want. When I need to know something for the annals, I usually have an idea when things happened, where and who was involved. It's a chance to flit off and double-check my memory, which I found to be astonishingly unreliable. Apparently none of us really remember anything exactly the way it happened. And often, the divergence is proportional to the amount of ego and wishful thinking we've invested. One Eye has his ego problems, of course. Maybe they're why he won't let me wander through his arms factory. If it does not have something to do with guarding his ledgers from outside scrutiny, I will spy on him, now that he plans to close down soon. One Eye carries a lot on his old shoulders. Among the things he does is he acts as a sort of minister of armaments. He has a whole fortified section of town where he oversees the manufacture of everything from arrowheads to monster siege engines. Much of his production gets crated up and sent straight to the docks to be loaded aboard barges and sent downriver to the delta, where, via a series of crude canals, the barges are worked over into the Nagir River, which shares the delta. Then they travel up the Nagir and the tributaries to armories near the frontier. I have no doubt that some of the material fails to reach its destination. I expect that one eye somehow profits. I hope he has sense enough not to sell to the enemy. Croker catches him doing that, and one eye will think that Blade gets treated like a mischievous kid brother. My first swoop into the arsenal was a quick psychic raid. One Eye's compound consisted of a gaggle of once dissimilar and unrelated structures, now interconnected in a mad maze. All windows and most doors had been bricked up. Men selected for their size, bad tempers, and lack of imagination infested the few entrances. They allowed no one in and no one out. The street outside the freight entrance was crowded day and night. Files of wagons and carts, drawn by weary oxen, crept forward to be unloaded and loaded by weary workmen, watched banefully by the unimaginative men who foamed at the mouth of carters and laborers so much as made eye contact. Around and amongst the carts swarmed countless runners carrying long poles from which hung dozens of pails filled with hot food for the workers. The guards checked every pail. They even took turns checking on each other. Taglios has a richly diverse, complex, and deeply specialized labor economy. Folks will make a living one way or another, and other folks will give them room. Near the palace is a bazaar, devoted entirely to grooming services, catering mainly to palace functionaries. One guy does nothing but trim nose hairs. Right beside him, operating in a space less than four feet wide, with oils and silver tools displayed on a tiny inlaid table, is an old character who will clean the wax from your ears. He does nothing else but retail gossip. This business has been in his family for generations. He's sad because he has no son to inherit. When he goes, his family will lose that space in the bazaar. It's all symptomatic of horrid overpopulation and the desperate difficulty of surviving at the bottom. I would not want to be a taglion of low caste. Lucky me. I did not have to check in with one-eyes thugs. There seemed to be no provision against magical espionage. I darted inside. I guess one I didn't worry because Long Shadow could no longer send his pet snooping this far. But what about the Howler? He could sneak up on us any time he wanted. Trying to track Howler was one of my regular duties. The arsenal workers were doing ordinary things, making arrowheads, sharpening them, making arrows, fletching them, 
building artillery pieces, attempting to mass-produce a light cotton body armor for the ordinary infantrymen, who no doubt would discard it because it was hot and uncomfortable and a nuisance to lug around. Only the glass blower surprised me. There were two dozen workers in that department, and most were employed producing small, thin bottles. A platoon of apprentices tended fires, heated the silicates that became raw glass, carried off trays of bottles once they cooled. Those went to carpenters who placed them into crates with sawdust packing. A few of the crates went aboard big, long-haul wagons, but most went to the waterfront. What the devil... There was a big piece of slate in One Eye's office. Upon it, in Forsberger, were chalked what appeared to be production targets. Fifty thousand bottles. Three million arrows. Five hundred thousand javelins. Ten thousand cavalry lances. Ten thousand sabers. Eight thousand saddles. One hundred fifty thousand infantry short swords. Some of those numbers were absurd, and there was no way any could be reached by One Eye's arsenal alone. But production took place all over the Taglian territories, most often in one man blacksmith shops. One Eye's main job was to keep track, which looked to me a lot like letting the fox do bed check at the chicken house. The list also included animals and wagons and lumber by the hundred barge loads much of which I did understand. But 5,000 box kites, ready for assembly, 12 feet by 3 feet, each with 1,000 feet of string, 100,000 yards of silk in bolts 6 feet tall. He was not going to get that one. I went roving to see what else was being readied from Ogaba and his friends. I saw training camps where commando teams prepared for every imaginable terrain and mission. Down south, Lady pursued her own programs, creating forces prepared to operate offensively on the sorcerous battlefield. She had scoured the Taglian territories for every person possessed of even the slightest magical talent and had schooled them just enough to make them useful in a program I couldn't fathom no matter how I poked at it. As Long Shadow had noted, she was stripping the Taglian territories of bamboo. That got cut into several standard lengths and had red-hot rods run through to burn out the joints. Lady had the resulting tubes packed with little spongy colored marbles created by her squads of hedge wizards. Another game of baffle the Shadow Master. Half of what we were doing was smoke and mirrors, meant to confuse the opposition and make them waste resources or commit them in the wrong places. But I was more confused than Long Shadow could possibly be. Lady slept less than did the captain. Croker seldom slept more than five hours a night. If sheer drive could conquer Mogaba and the Shadow Master, we were surefire winners. Both Lady and the old man hide so much inside themselves that even after all these years, I have no sure grasp of how they think. They share a strong love, but seldom demonstrate it. They want to recover their daughter and avenge themselves upon the deceivers, but never speak of the child publicly. Croker is determined to lead the company back to mysterious Katovar, to unearth its origins but does not talk about that at all anymore. On the surface, it would seem those two live only for the war. I drifted back to One Eye's factory. I was reluctant to leave Smoke. I knew if I delayed much longer, I would return to find my body exhausted, starved, and extremely thirsty. The smart way to use smoke was to take short journeys mixed with lots of times out for snacks and drinks. But that was hard to recall out there, especially when there was so much pain waiting back in my own slice of reality. 
This time, I discovered a room I had overlooked earlier. In it, Vedna workers moved lazily amongst a dozen ceramic tubs. Some carried buckets from which they scooped fluid into the tubs a cup at a time. The fluid came from a vat a man kept stirring when he was not adding water or some white powder. I saw little remarkable about those tubs. The solution got added at one end. At the other end, fluid trickled down a glass tube into a large earthenware jug. Once filled, each jug got stopped and carried carefully to storage on shelves well out of the way. Unlike wines, they were shelved upright. Curiously, the lamps in the room burned unusually bright. I studied one tub, noted that small bubbles kept rising at the end where the workers added the fluid. At the far end, well below the surface, were dozens of short rods caked with a silvery white substance. On the floor of the tub were several handleless glass cups. Using ceramic tools, a gloved worker moved a cup under a rod, scraped stuff off into the cup. Once that settled, he used wooden tongs to lift the cup from the tub. He carried it with considerable care, but nevertheless managed to stumble. The stuff off the rod blazed fiercely when exposed to the air. I had to get back to my flesh. I had to eat. Soon enough, I would have to pack because, real soon, all of us would be headed south. The war's next stage was gathering momentum. Chapter 91 Otto and Hagop were back, after innumerable frustrating delays in the last river leg, which should have been the easiest part of their journey. They were concealed in the same Shadar waterfront warehouse that I had used to hold the captives from the Grove of Doom. One eye collected me from my quarters. He and I and my brown shadow headed for the river. The old man beat us there. He could drop everything when he really wanted. You all right, Mergen? I'm handling it. He's spending too much time with smoke. One I said. That don't sound healthy. Would you look at these guys? He meant Otto and Hagop, though the others of their expedition were confined to the warehouse too, and were not enthusiastic about being kept away from their families. It had been almost three years. Neither Otto nor Hagop looked much different. I told Hagop, I'd almost given up on you guys. We shook hands. I shook with Otto, too. I thought your luck finally ran out. We came close, Mergen. We used up a lot. So, the old man said, what took so long? Actually, there ain't that much to tell. Hagop looked at Croker oddly as though to make sure he was talking to the real old man. Croker was in a Shadar disguise. We went, we did what we could, we came back. Like a 14,000 mile round trip was routine. In the company, we don't brag about the big stuff. We didn't do a lot of sightseeing. While Hagop talked, Otto made a circuit of the doors and windows. He asked, We need to worry about spies? This is Taglios, Croker replied, by which he meant that everyone is always watching everyone else, looking for an edge. We figured you guys would have them all squared away by now. That's a lot of squaring. Shadowlander spies, yeah, they aren't a problem. Lady and Goblin and One Eye took care of them. I said, We still have the priesthoods. And we've had a little deceiver trouble lately. Something in my face warned Hag up against pursuing that. Not now. How goes the war then? Slowly, Kroger told him. 
We could talk about that later. You do us any good up there? Not much, to be honest. Damn. We did get a bunch of stuff for the annals. Mergen, you might want to work it in. It's tough about what other people were doing that will help make better sense of what we did. I figure you could work it in between stuff that Croker wrote. That way, them that comes after us can see both sides. Huh? Maybe you ought to take over. Sourly. Learn me how to read and write. I'm too old for this other shit. Might do that. I glanced at Croker. Long as you don't edit me. The old man grinned. Haggot chuckled. The gods for Finn, Morgan. Not me. Hey, I found out all about what happened after we left up there, too. You wouldn't believe the excitement. The limper came back one more time. But don't worry, it's all settled now. The Empire is boring these days. Sounds like I wish I was back home. Croker asked, Did you actually get into the tower? We spent six months there. Mainly getting the runaround at first. And? We finally convinced them that Lady was getting her powers back. They got cooperative then. Folks in the tower these days like not having her around. Gee, that'll break her heart, I said. Hagop grinned. Yeah. They won't send us any help. Say, they don't want to make any new enemies. I think it's mostly because they don't want Lady getting nostalgic for her good old days and heading back north, Croker said. We figured that. There's nothing in this for them but keeping Lady away. What did you get? They opened their records lent us translators, even opened graves when we asked. They would have an interest in who was buried there themselves. Damned if they didn't. They had to change their linens after we told them who all turned up alive down here. See, they had a major scare when the limper came back and damned near took them apart. I said, that guy had a bigger boner for us than Soulcatcher does. No way did we need to add the limper to our list of enemies. What about my turnip seeds? Hagop said. They made sure of limper this time. Absolutely sure. I got your seeds. Turnips and parsnips and even some seed potatoes. If they haven't spoiled. Croker said. They would make sure of limper. He watched Otto prowl. Otto was restless, uncomfortable. So they let you poke around and even gave you some help with it. What did you learn? That had been the point. To see if they knew anything way up north that we could use here. Not much. It don't seem likely that Long Shadow was ever one of the taken. I was confident of that. I was sure he would have betrayed himself to Howler by now, if they'd been allies in the past. Those potatoes. Did you get the little kind like I... Hagop glowered at me, told the old man. There is the remotest chance that he could be the faceless man, Moonbiter or Nightcrawler, although everybody up there was sure those three really did bite the dust. It was just that we couldn't come up with any bodies. How about one of the later taken? Croker mused. Five actually survived. Journey, Whisper, Blister, Creeper, and Learned. But ladies stripped all five of their powers. In front of witnesses. But Lady has been getting her powers back, I argued. A point... On the other hand, we know the exact day when the Shadow Masters appeared. Even the hour, I gather. All the later taken were still in business up north. In fact, most of them weren't even taken yet. 
I traded glances with the old man. He began pacing. He said, When Soul Catcher held me captive, she told me one of the Shadow Masters who died at Dejagore wasn't ever one of the taken. I added, Neither was Shadow Spinner. Hagop said, All they could tell us really was that they didn't have a clue if Long Shadow used to be one of the old mob. The written record supported them. Croker kept pacing, narrowly avoided a collision with Otto, but stayed well away from the cluster of unhappy Taglians awaiting his blessing upon their desires to go home. After all this time, could they recognize him through his Shadar disguise? Probably. I was sure he was thinking that this war with the Shadow Masters was no ordinary struggle, that the stakes went far beyond simple survival. He said, We've taken three of the bastards down. But Long Shadow's the worst. He's the craziest. He's working on Overlook day and night. Still, still. The poor idiot is a living testimonial to the fact that everything takes longer and costs more. Even magic can't get you around that. But he is a lot closer to being finished than he was when you left. And if he does get done before we get him, we can bend over and kiss our butts goodbye. It'll be the end of the world. His plan is to pull his hole in behind him and loose the dogs of hell. Then come out later and collect up the pieces of whatever is left. I grumbled. I've heard this one before. I never took it entirely serious, despite the characters involved. But it did sound like Croker believed Long Shadow was capable of doing it. Maybe his adventures with Smoke had shown him something I'd missed so far. So, the end of the world was imminent, either at the hands of Kina and her deceivers, or at those of Long Shadow. Either way, only the Black Company could prevent the tragedy. Yeah, sure. I wanted to tell Kroger, old buddy, we're only the Black Company. We're just a gang of misfits who can't make it in life except as hired swords. Sure, we got ourselves into an ass-kicking contest with some bizarro creeps now, but there ain't nobody going to care in a hundred years. We are entangled in an affair of honor because of promises we made and stuff like the strangler snatching your kid. But don't try to sell anybody on saving the world. I was scared the old man might be developing a case of the big head, like Long Shadow, Mogaba, the Howler, Kina, all the devils of our time. One of the analyst's duties is to remind the captain that he's not a demigod but I was out of practice. Hell, I could not deflate Uncle Doge when he got going. I need an edge, Hagop, Croker said. I need it bad. Tell me you found something. Anything. I found Mergen's turnip seeds. Damn it. The best suggestion they had was that we might try to trace the survivors of the Circle of Eighteen. Well, that was interesting. Croker stopped pacing. He looked at me as though I might be able to tell him something. I saw his focus fade. He was remembering the battle at Charm. The Circle of Eighteen raised huge rebel armies to pull Lady down. The culminating battle at Charm had been the bloodiest in recorded history. The Circle did not win. Croker said, We killed Harden and Raker. Lady turned, whispered to Taken. That accounts for three. A lot more just got lost when we whipped them. I observed. My we drew smiles from Otto, Hagop, and the old man. I was maybe twelve at the time and had not yet even heard of the Black Company. Hagop said, 
We were too damned thorough back then, boss. We went out looking for and flat could not find any rebel veterans to interrogate. We couldn't even find names for seven of the eighteen. But there were people at the tower, who were junior officers then, who claimed they'd witnessed the deaths of all of the eighteen, except one called Trinket. Those who became taken, and one of the ones whose names we couldn't find out. Trinket. Croker resumed pacing. He mused. I remember Trinket, but just the name. We were at the stair of Tear. We got word that Trinket was surrounded in the east. We were busy with Harden. I don't know if I even mentioned it in the annals. Ha, a chance to show off. You did. One sentence. That's it, though. You said Whisper had taken Rust and Trinket was surrounded. Whisper, yes, she'd been taken only a little while. He'd been there to help set up the taking. That's one for Lady. She would know if there was anything between those two. Trinket was female, Hagop told us. What's Long Shadow? Croker frowned. I said, he never gets all the way naked, but I'm pretty sure Long Shadow is a he, physically. The old man offered me a dagger's look. Damn. But the Taglians were way off in a corner sulking. None of them caught my slip. Hagop was not on the list of three either, though. I hastened to amend myself. But Smoke is the only one who ever saw him in the flesh, and he ain't talking. He's still alive? Hagop asked. Barely, Croker said. We keep him alive. Men have come back from comas before. That's it, Hagop? All that time and travel, that's all you got me. That's the way she goes sometimes, boss. He grinned. Oh, I almost forgot. They did give me a coffin full of papers and stuff that might have belonged to some of the people who maybe could have turned into Long Shadow, if he was ever one of the eighteen. The stuff is all packaged and labeled in case some wizard decides he wants to use them. Croker's face lit up like a bonfire. You shithead! Grinning, he yelled, Otto, send them guys home, why don't you? Bonharge, the rest of you, what the hell are you doing hanging around here? Your people want to see you. He told me, guess we ought to ship that stuff down to Lady. She'll know what to do with it. Otto hustled the Taglians out of the warehouse. They seemed baffled by the Liberator's sudden generosity. Me too. Hagop said, Now how about you guys telling what's been happening? I said, A whole lot, but nothing big and dramatic. We keep nibbling them to death. Is Mogaba really the head honcho of Long Shadow's army? Absolutely. He's one kick-ass son of a bitch, too. Only Long Shadow won't let him run loose. He has to mess with us second-hand, mostly, letting Blade do his dirty work. Huh? Blade? Like in Blade of Blade and Mather and Swan? Oh, yeah. I glanced at the old man, whose expression had gone stony. Yeah, Blade defected while you were gone. Let's get back to the palace, Mergen. Croker said. We have work to do. Chapter 92 Croker didn't say much as we walked, though he did snarl at people who dared stare at the Shadar and his white devil companion. 
We northerners are so few that even after years, few of the commoners have yet seen any of us. And, of course, we've done very little to dispel our evil reputation. Some intellectuals inside the priesthoods have argued that the friendship of today's black company is as deadly to Taglios as was the enmity of its remote forebears. Their complaint may have merit. We were coming up to the palace. Croker kept grumbling to himself, mostly because so little had come of the expedition. That had been his pet, and his expectations had run away with him. He asked, How long are your in-laws going to hang around? I wasn't going to make him happy. For the duration. They want their slice of Narayan Singh. The old man still distrusted Uncle Doge. They know about smoke? Of course not. Damn it. Keep it that way. You find his library again yet? I had mentioned having stumbled onto that. Not yet. Fact was, I had made no more than a token effort. I had too much else on my mind. Try a little harder. He knew. Don't spend so much time with smoke. And I think it might be useful to look at those old annals before we head south. How come you never looked for the library yourself? You've had years. I heard it got destroyed the night that smoke got mauled. Now it looks like that must have happened in some other room. The Radisha wouldn't mislead me about something like that. Would she? Nah. We paused while a Vedna cavalry regiment passed in review outside the palace. It had come from upcountry somewhere and was just paying its respects before taking the field. The robes and turbans of the troopers were clean and gaudy. Their lances were all brightly pennoned. Their spearheads gleamed. Their mounts were beautiful, admirably trained and perfectly groomed. Too bad pretty don't win wars, I said. The black company isn't pretty. Croker grunted. I glanced at him and surprised what might have been a teardrop in the corner of his eye. He knew what awaited all those brave young men. We crossed behind the horsemen, stepping carefully. One eye met us in the hallway outside Croker's apartment. What's the word? Croker shook his head. No magic answers. We always get to do it the hard way. I told him, I'm supposed to look for that library room I found the other night. You got something to help keep me from getting confused? He looked at me like that might be a tall order. I already gave you something. He indicated the yarn on my wrist. That was for your spells. There's probably still a bunch of smokes left over, too. The runt thought about that. Could be. Give me that. His gaze fell on my amulet as I removed the yarn. Jade. He held my wrist momentarily. I think so. It belonged to Sari's grandmother, Hong Tre. You never met her. She was the old speaker's wife. You've been wearing this all these years and I never noticed? I never wore it, till sorry, until the other night. Sorry wore it sometimes, though, when she wanted to dress up. Oh, yes, I recall. He frowned like he was trying to remember something, then shrugged, went off into a shadow, and muttered to the yarn for a while. When he returned, he said, That ought to get you through anybody's confusion spells. Except maybe your own. What? You had any of your attacks lately? No, not that I remember. 
I offered the amendment because I had had them before without being aware of them. Apparently. You had any new ideas about what caused them? Or who you kept running into when you went back to Dejigore? I was escaping from the pain of losing Sari. One eye laid one of his more intense stares upon me. Just the way he had whenever he helped fish me out of the past. Evidently, he was not convinced. I asked, is it suddenly important again? It never stopped being important, Merrigan. There just hasn't been time to pursue it. Nor was there now. He said, We just have to let you take charge of yourself, to watch out and do the right thing in a crunch. One eye being totally serious? That was spooky. Croker had lost interest. He was back at his charts and figures. But he did reiterate, I want to see those books before we hit the road. I can take a hint. Sometimes. I'm on my way, boss. Chapter 93 I stopped in to make sure Smoke was still breathing. I fed him while I was there. Keeping him fed and clean was now my cover for being there should someone like the Radishai ever penetrate One-Eye's network of spells, much augmented since I'd begun working with the old wizard. Then I tried to recall the various twists and turns I'd taken the night I found Smoke's library. My memories weren't clear. That had been a time of stress, and a lot had happened since. I did know it was on this same level. I had not gone downstairs or up. And it was in an area apparently undisturbed since Smoke's own last visit. The dust and cobwebs were heavy and untouched. It did not take me long to reach desert territory. It was almost as though the deep interior of the palace became a vast and dusty maze, needing no spells of confusion to protect it. I found the dead man only minutes after leaving Smoke. I smelled him first, of course, and heard the flies. That told me what would be coming up before I saw anything. Only, the who was a mystery, until the strangler appeared at the limit of my lamplight. He had fled here to die of his wounds, trapped by darkness and confusing spells. I shuddered. That touched my deepest fears, the wellspring of my nightmares, my crushing dread of tight, dark places underground. I wondered if his fickle goddess had taken delight in his unhappy end. I moved around the corpse, carefully, averting my eyes and pinching my nose. In death, he continued to serve Kina's corruption avatar. Soon afterward, I discovered evidence that at least one more strangler had become entangled in the confusion of the palace. I nearly stepped in it being alerted only when my approach startled the attendant flies. I paused. Uh-oh. That looked fairly fresh. Maybe there was still a madman in here, willing to dance for his goddess. I started moving much slower and more carefully, one hand at my throat. I started imagining noises. All the ghost stories I ever heard came back to haunt me. Each few steps I paused, turned around completely, searching for the gleam of eyes betrayed by my lamp. Why did I decide to do this alone? I began to see signs of recent traffic. I knelt, discovered what appeared to be my own previous footprints in the dust. Someone had been through since, armed with a battery of candles. Drops of wax had fallen into the disturbed dust, and somebody had been through after that, possibly crawling, perhaps even eating what wax drops he could find. 
I listened to the silence. This deep within the palace, even vermin were scarce. They could only eat each other. Still cautious, I followed the trails of those who'd come after me. My heart thumped like I was about to explode. I started sneezing. And once I did, the sneezes just kept coming. I could hold off for half a minute sometimes, but that only made the next sneeze worse. Then I started hearing all sorts of sounds and couldn't still myself long enough to reassure me that I was imagining these noises too or to get a fix on their source if they were genuine. Maybe it would be better to do this some other time. Then the broken door loomed out of the darkness. I stopped and studied it. I had a notion it was hanging a little differently. Disturbances in the dust suggested that someone had visited since I had done so myself. Cautiously, touching nothing, I rounded the door, stepped into the room. Shit! It had been torn apart. Few of the books, bound or scroll, remained on their shelves or in their cubbies. The undisturbed items, where I could decipher titles, were prosaic inventories or tax records or irregular city histories of little interest. I wondered why Smoke would bother with those. Maybe just to hide the good stuff? Maybe because he was a fire marshal as well as court wizard? Whatever. The good stuff was gone. And by that I mean not only any long-missing volumes of the annals that might have been lying around, but also a number of what I had suspected to be magical texts when last I looked in. Damn it, damn it! I wanted to throw things, to break things, to bounce rocks off villains' heads. Even before I found the single fallen feather, I had a good idea of what had happened. I collected that feather. On the way back, I definitely heard sounds that did not spring from my imagination. I did not bother to investigate. The man tried to follow my light, but could not keep up. Chapter 94 Croker looked up, puzzled, when I laid the white feather in front of him and said, the books are gone, and there are deceivers lost in there, at least one dead one and one still alive. Gone! He plucked the feather off the document he was studying. Somebody took them. His distress was apparent only because his hand began to shake. How? They just walked in off the street and carried them away. I did not for a moment consider the possibility that someone inside the palace had visited Smoke's books. He said nothing for a while. What perfect timing. Another silence. What's this feather? Maybe a message? Maybe just a lost feather? I found one like it when I discovered that the Widowmaker armor had disappeared from hiding in Dejigore. A white feather from an albino crow. I ran through my catalog of encounters, real and possibly imagined. His hand shook again. You never actually met her. But you recognized her? She was here the night the deceiver struck? And you never said anything? I forgot that. That was the worst night of my life, Captain. That night has twisted everything else around me. He gestured for silence. He thought. I stared. He was nothing like the croaker who'd been company physician and analyst when I joined up. After a while, he muttered, that must be it. What? 
the voice you encountered whenever you were pulled back to Dejigore. Think. Was it inconsistent? I don't think I understand. Did it seem like it might be different people talking all the time? Now I got it. I don't think so. It did seem to have different attitudes and style sometimes. The bitch. The sneaking bitch. Always playing another game. I won't swear this for sure, Mergen, but I think the root mystery behind you tumbling all over time must have been soul catcher playing. Not a wholly original theory to me. Soul catcher rated high on my own suspects list. Motive was my big stumbling block. I couldn't figure a why Mergen for anybody, soul catcher included. Where is she now? Croker asked. I don't have the foggiest. Can you find out? Smoke box every time I try to head her way. Croker considered that. Try again. You're the boss. As long as it suits everybody's convenience. You sure your in-laws won't go home? They're going wherever I go. Tell them we'll be on the road before the end of the week. I look forward to that like a case of the piles. I took my white feather and stomped off for a session with the fire marshal. Chapter 95 I didn't go straight there. I stopped by the apartment collected a flask of tea, a gallon of water, a basket of fried chicken and fried fish, rice and some of Mother Goda's special baked rocks. I expected a long session. There were things I wanted to do beyond my expected swift rebuff in a search for soul catcher. Smoke seemed unchanged. As always. I wondered what he would remember if as sometimes happened, one day he just woke up from his coma. I hear tell people have done that, even after being under years longer than Smoke has. I filled my stomach with water before I left the apartment. I took in more fluid when I reached Smoke. I went to work. Drifting. Quick check of all the villains. Mogaba and Longshadow, Howler and Narayan Singh and the Daughter of Night were all acceptably located, either at Overlook or Charandaprash. Blade was skirting the Shindai Kus with maybe twelve hundred men, trying to get behind the Prabrindra Dra. But the prince had a screen of light cavalry out far enough to give him plenty of warning. The man had a knack. Before I carried out my obligation to look for Soulcatcher, I took Smoke back in time to see just how early I could find and spy upon some of the principles. I wanted to see what had happened that night I had been held captive and tortured. I wanted to unveil the details of Mogaba's defection. I found that I couldn't go back that far. I recalled that raft on the lake, Mogaba cursing in the darkness. That had to be it. He shouldn't have been there. What honest mission could have taken him ashore? Had he changed allegiances while still holding Dejagore for the good guys? Was his deal already made when Croker faced him down? Did he meet Howler out there, far enough away that Goblin and One-Eye would not detect the sorcerer's flying carpet? Maybe. And if he had, that might explain why even Sindawe and Ochiba were willing to abandon him. All of us would be dead already, and the war long since lost, had Longshadow been in a position to seize that moment. The cold claws of death may have come closer than ever I had suspected. I wish I could have had eyewitness evidence, though. Smoke can be tricked. 
and he can be driven by a sufficiently determined will. From the frontiers of past time, I raced toward the night of my despair. I didn't drive him to the center of its evil, though. Instead, I slowed and drifted into an earlier hour, as the stranglers first approached the palace, and, in best deceiver form, used two of their number, disguised as holy prostitutes of Bashra, out to perform their obligated random acts of joy, to get close to the guards. But that was not the history I wanted to review. I brought him forward to the moments of my own interlude upon the Sally Port steps. I watched myself emerge from the palace, vacantly settled to the stone. The seizure lasted scarcely a minute, for all the time I spent amongst the horrors of yesteryear. Now, the slick move. The focus upon the woman in the shadows across the way, behind the hairy Shadar. The lock onto her, despite Smoke's increasing anxiety and spiritual wriggling. I never got to know Smoke in full life, but, by most accounts, he had been a pure chicken shit. Inalterably opposed to anything that might involve even the most minor risk to anyone in the court wizard, or fire marshal rackets. Cowardice must have run right down to the foundations of his being, because he writhed like a worm on a fish hook the whole time I watched Soulcatcher loot his library. She had no trouble with confusion spells. She had none with stranglers either, though she did encounter a band. They just gaped at her briefly, then decided their best interests ought to lead them elsewhere. She seemed unaware of my scrutiny, unlike that time in the wheat field. Could it be that even she was unaware of the secret of smoke? Wouldn't that be lovely? I watched her for a long time, even after she departed the palace. Smoke resisted every second. Then I went back and had a drink and a snack before I tackled the more interesting business of tracking Goblin down and, to slake my own curiosity, having a look at the final falling out between Croker and Blade. I'd been unable to find witnesses to the actual explosion. Chapter 96 to track Goblin, I went back to the last time I saw the runt myself, then followed him forward in time. Soon after having helped me out of one of my plunges into yesterday, Goblin walked out of his quarters, carrying one modest bag, hiked to the waterfront, boarded a barge manned by trustworthy Taglians who had become professional soldiers, and drifted down the river. Right now, approximately today, he was in the heart of the Delta, transferring the barge's cargo, himself and most of the Taglians, to a deep-sea vessel wearing flags and pennons entirely unknown to me. Off on the sodden shore, flocks of Nguengbao children and a handful of lazy adults watched, as though this business of outsiders was the greatest entertainment they'd encountered in years. Despite my familiarity with the tribe, they all looked inscrutably alien in their native context, more so than they had in Dejigore, where we all had been out of place. For no reason clear to me, I had never visited Sara's world. I just welcomed her into mine and savored the miracle. Goblin's behavior was less interesting than his whereabouts, which I'd now established. So, why not see what life was like for the Nguyen Bao? Uncle Doge insisted that the Delta was paradise. Possibly. If you were of the Mosquito Clan. I swear. The fact that I was a disembodied point of view was all that kept me from being devoured. Goblin was candy-ass enough to protect himself and his crew with potent spells, augmented by bad smells, 
But the Nguyen Bao had to deal with blood-sucking buzzards able to carry off small children. I reminded myself that I had seen all the bugs I wanted coming south through One-Eye's home jungle. And it was likely that Sari's people could manage excellently without the presence of Sari's husband. I drifted through the area, curious about how she had lived before we met. Hamlet, rice paddies, water buffalo, fishing boats, the same yesterday, last year, last century, and tomorrow. Everyone I saw looked like someone I might have met in Dejagore or among the Nguyen Bao serving with the company now. What? I was sweeping along like a darting swallow. I glimpsed a face looking up in a hamlet miles back from the river where Goblin and his crew were sweating their guts out. My heart flipped. For the first time out there with smoke, I enjoyed a really strong emotion. If I had been in my body, I would have wept crocodile tears. Man-eating crocs adorned the delta, too. I whipped back, around, hunting that face so much like Sara's that it could have belonged to her twin. Down there somewhere, near that old temple. No. I guess not. Wishful thinking, Mergen. Plain, wishful thinking. Probably just another Nguyen Bao girl, newly a woman, endowed with that incredible beauty they have for four or five years, between childhood and the steep slope into despair. I pressed in once more, wanting desperately to find even the simulacrum of Sara. And, of course, I found nothing. The pain became so great I withdrew from that region entirely and went looking for a place in time where the gods held me in higher favor. Chapter 97 I had to fall backward in time, tumbling smugly toward the one era in my life when I was totally happy, when perfection was the order of the universe. I went to the hour that was my pole star, my center, my altar. I went to the moment every man who ever lived dreams of. That one instant, when all wishes and fantasies have the potential to come true, and you have only to recognize that and grab it within a heartbeat to make your life complete. For me, that moment came almost a year after the end of the Siege of Dejagore, and I almost wasted it. Nguyen Bao were almost always a part of my life then. A scant three weeks following Croker's showdown with Mogaba and Mogaba's consequent flight, while us survivors were still creeping north toward Taglios, pretending to be triumphant heroes who'd liberated a friendly city, and rid the world of a bunch of villains. I awakened one morning to find myself under the dubious and permanent protection of Tai Day. He was no more talkative than ever, but in a few words he insisted that he owed me big, and he was going to stick to me forever. I thought that was just hyperbole. Boy, was I thrilled. I wasn't in a mood to cut his throat, so I let him hang on. And he did have a sister I wanted to see a lot more than I wanted to see him, though I never found the nerve to tell him that. Even so. Back in the city, established in the palace, in my tiny room with my papers and books and tie day, sleeping on a reed mat outside my door, him insisting that Totan was in good hands with his grandmother. I lived a life of confusion, trying to figure out what had happened to us all and to make sense of ladies' writings. I was not thinking with absolute clarity when I received a gentleman 
name of Bando Trang, who was a relative of one of the pilgrims of Dejigori. He had a message for me. It was so cryptic, it could have qualified as one of the great goofball Sibylline pronouncements of all time. Eleven hills over the edge, he kissed her. Brother Bon told me. All splashed up with a huge and unwing bow grin. But the others were not for hire. To which I offered this countersign. Six blue birds in a peppermint tree, warbling limericks of apathy. Death of the grin. What? That's my line, Pop. You told the guys downstairs you had a critical message for me. Against my better judgment, I let you come up here, and right away you start spouting nonsense. Tamal! I yelled at the orderly who assisted me and several others who worked out of rooms nearby. Show this clown the way to the street. Dotrang wanted to argue, looked at my sidekick, thought better of making a fuss. Taide watched the old boy closely, but did not look like he wanted the honor of flinging him out on his enigmatic ass personally. Poor Bon. It must have been important to him. He seemed stricken. Tamal was a huge Shadar man-bear, all hair and growl and bad breath. He would have liked nothing better than to pummel Anyuang Bao all the way to the street and thence to the edge of the city. Ban went without protest. Less than a week later, I received the identical message as a handwritten note that looked like it had been inscribed by a six-year-old. One of Cordy Mather's guards brought it up. I read it, told him... Give the old fool a beating and tell him not to bother me again. The guard gave me a funny look. He glanced at Tai Day, then whispered, Ain't old, ain't I him, but probably is a fool, standard bear. Was I you? I'd take the time. I got it. At last. I'll just box his ears myself, then. Tie day. Try to keep the bad guys out. I'll be back in a few minutes. He didn't listen, of course, because he couldn't bodyguard me from a distance. But I did confuse him long enough to get a head start. I got down there and got my hands on Sara before he caught up or got ahead of me. After that, he had little say and my clever lady had brought Totan to distract him. Taide didn't talk much, but that didn't make him stupid. He knew he couldn't win with the cards he held right now. Clever, I told Sara. I thought I'd never see you again. Hi, kiddo, I said to Totan, who didn't remember me. Sara, honey, you gotta promise me. No more of that cryptic stuff like Grandpa Dom. I'm just a simple-minded soldier. I led Sara inside and up to my little hole in the wall. For the next three years, I marveled every morning when I wakened to find her beside me, and almost every time I saw her during the day. She became the center of my life, my anchor, my rock, my goddess, and every damned one of my brothers envied me almost to the borders of hatred, though Sara converted them all into devoted friends. She could give lady lessons on softening the hearts of hard men. Not till Uncle Doge and Mother Gota came to visit did I find out that Sara had done more than just defy the customs of the Nguyen Bao. She had ignored the express orders of her tribal elders to come make herself the wife of a soldier of darkness. Confident little witch, those toothless old men put no value on the wishes of the witch Ki Hong Trey. 
I think I have a realistic picture of who and what I am, so I'm amazed that Sarah ever thought as much of me as I thought of her. Chapter 98 I sipped water, ate, and reflected that this was one time when I had no trouble leaving Smoke's world. There was no attenuation of the pain if I went out there to see Sari. What was I doing here? There was one mystery yet to be illuminated before I allowed Croker to drag me off into the next fun phase of our great adventure. I wanted to know what had happened between him and Blade. Smoke and I zigzagged back and forth through time, quartering the temporal reaches, tacking into the winds of time, following a search pattern, looking for anomalies in the relationship between Blade and my boss. I knew about when the blow-up happened, so, instead, for the time being, I sought contributory evidence. You can cover a lot of time fast riding smoke, it didn't take long to establish, beyond a doubt, that Blade's relationship with Lady was never anything but proper, however charged with wishful thinking on his end. Lady never acknowledged Blade's moon eyes, nor those of anyone else. She seemed too accustomed to them to pay them any mind. So what did happen? I worried it like a wild dog trying to dig a rodent out of its hole. Smoke was no help at all. There were places, times, angles that he just refused to go see. I tried tricking him several ways just to find out why he couldn't or wouldn't go where I wanted him to go. None of that did any good. Maybe I was baying down the wrong trail. The actual headbutting had been less than wildly explosive, and made only marginal sense when viewed from another point in time. All I could find out that made sense was that Blade and Croker were sipping some potent homebrew before they started getting crazy. Verbal sniping turned into angry implications, which became threats on the old man's part. And the beer continued to flow. I have to say that Croker was definitely the bad guy or fool. He kept on and on while Blade did his best not to let himself be baited. That only infuriated Croker. He spouted threats that left Blade no choice but to run. I backed away, embarrassed for my captain. I hadn't thought that he could be such a complete asshole. I didn't understand why he was so insecure about Lady. I felt for Blade deeply, and had to think less of one of my heroes. Now that I reflected on it, I recalled occasional bestowals of unpleasantries upon Willow Swan that had not gotten out of hand, and Croker had even exchanged crosswords with the Prabhrindra Dra once. I sensed a pattern. It wasn't one I wanted to see. But it was obvious, if you looked for it. Croker was obsessed with his woman. He would alienate anyone who offered her too much attention, however costly that might be. Shit, why? She wasn't sorry. We had lost Blade already. I don't have a lot of use for Willow Swan, who is much too pretty and too blonde, but I would really hate to have the company on the wrong side of the prince just because one man couldn't be sure of his woman. More scales fell from my eyes, leaving disappointment behind. I needed to take this up with the brain trust, the oldest of the old, one eye, Otto, and Hagop. Goblin was too far away, and Lady both too far and disqualified by being too intimately involved. A captain who thought with his balls instead of his brains could get a lot of people killed. 
I don't worship any gods myself, though I guess some are real in their own ways. I have to believe that all of them get regular belly laughs because one of them was ingenious enough to create human sexuality. Even greed and lust for power don't come close to generating the stupidities that us being male and female do. But by giving it half a thought, I can think of as many glories that spring from the same dichotomy. Say, Kisara. God's Mergen. You need to get away from this half-dead old man. You're a hired sword. A soldier. You should not be playing philosophical games. Not even with yourself. Chapter 99 I popped out of contact with smoke. It's time, One-Eye. She's gone. The little wizard tossed a friendly miniature owl into the darkened hallway. Untouched by confusion spells, it headed for that part of town where it imagined it nested. It didn't look for any particular human. That was not its mission. But plenty of humans looked for it. When it fluttered past them, two dozen black company veterans and their Nguang Bao bodyguards rushed a building that had deserved raising a generation before the Shadow Masters entered this quarter of the world. I had tracked Soulcatcher back to that building from her raid on Smoke's library. She felt so safe there, she was almost contemptuous of security precautions. She'd managed to get by undisturbed there for years. She was going to be one unhappy player when she discovered that she was less in control than she imagined. I watched, pleased, while black company soldiers took the building by the numbers and in a manner so professional that not one captain ever would have found cause for complaint. The men now even had the knack of getting their jobs done without stumbling over the Nguang Bao, who were worse than a herd of cats when it came to getting underfoot. You just had to use them like they were your shadows. Hardly anyone not directly involved noticed my guys. They got inside, spread out, dug deep, found what I wanted, gathered it up, and got back out long before Soulcatcher discovered that she'd been outmaneuvered. Otto and Hagop directed the raid. Putting them in charge was my way of bringing them back into the family. Good soldiers. They carried out my suggestions, not just cleaning out Soulcatcher's hideout, but grabbing her favorite white crow. They plucked a couple of his feathers and left them in place of the books, tied together with a strand of hair taken from the head of a much younger soul catcher a long time back and come south with the plunder brought by Otto and Hagop. That ought to rattle her. Maybe I should have let Croker and Lady in on my scheme. In a way, I was making a statement in their names. But this had become personal. I had a statement to make from Mergen and there was no time for consultations and conferences. Smoke and I swooped over the guys as they lugged their plunder toward the palace. I meant to give the books to Croker as soon as they arrived. He could do whatever he wanted with them, which probably meant that they would bounce once and land back in my lap, to be disappeared from the ken of all villains and villainesses probably no better than I had hidden the Widowmaker armor. I wondered if I was going to get too intimate with the meaning of hubris. Soulcatcher would know who'd done her wrong. She was maybe only a year younger than Lady, which left her an ageless amount trickier and nastier than me but what did I have to lose? The only thing I ever loved was gone. I could dance with disaster and grin to the end. 
Soulcatcher couldn't do anything that would hurt more than losing Sara had. Really. Sometimes you bullshit yourself. Chapter 100 An hour before sunset, four days before the winter solstice, consulting neither the convenience of mortal man, nor sorcerer, nor god or goddess, the earth shifted and shook. In Taglios, dishes tumbled off shelves, sleepers awakened in confused panic, dogs howled, and cracks appeared in old walls whose foundations had been set with incomplete diligence or without forethought for the possibility of earthquake. It was a half-hour sensation. In Dejigore, structures weakened by former high water or hidden structural defects yielded to the relentless seduction of gravity. Farther south, the impact was more severe. Beyond the Danda Presh, where mountains descended upon valleys with ferocious roars of triumph, the quake left epic horror. Kialune was devastated. Even Overlook suffered, though the masonry shrugged off the earth's worst. Long Shadow was in a panic for hours, until it became obvious that the Earth's convulsions had not broken his shadow gates and shadow traps. Then he began to rage because the destruction and loss of life in Shadow Catch would delay his construction efforts by months, perhaps even by years. Chapter 101 I had the vague feeling that somebody was looking over my shoulder. Though how anybody could get behind me when I was nothing but a floating viewpoint, I didn't know. The voice wasn't there, but otherwise, the feeling of presence was the same as it was during my earliest plunges into the horrors of Dejigore, with the taunting spirit that must have been Soulcatcher. Only a smell accompanied this presence an odor, like, like the smell of the dead strangler I'd found in the deeps of the palace, like the stench that had become so much a part of life in Dejigore that eventually you noticed it only when it was gone. It was the smell of death. I had felt a full measure of pain in the delta, imagining that I saw Sara alive among the Yuangbao, despite being out in the numb with smoke. Now, I enjoyed a full measure of terror, despite being out there. I began doing what in flesh would have been a full turnaround, slowly. I turned a second time and a third, and a fourth, each time faster than the last, and each time less in control. And each time around, as I faced what I suspected was southward, I glimpsed something vast and dark and horribly, each time more clearly. Till the last time around, I saw a black woman as tall as the sky. She was bare-ass naked. She had four arms and six teats and fangs like a vampire. The stench was her breath. Her eyes burned like windows into hell, yet looked into my own and held them and spoke to me with a blistering compulsion and promise. A ferocious eroticism beyond anything I had known with Sarah. I screamed. I popped out of Smoke's universe. Smoke had wanted to scream, too. I think he came close to being terrified awake. One Eye laughed. Cold enough, kid? I was soaked with very cold water. What the hell? You try staying out there forever again. I'll freeze your ass for good. I began to shake. 
Oh, shit, that's cold. I didn't tell him what I'd seen, why I was really shaking. Probably just my imagination running away with me again anyway. You dog turd. What the hell are you trying to do, give me a heart attack or something? No! Just trying to keep you from getting lost. You won't look out for yourself. I think I'm lost already, old-timer. The stars wink down in cold irony. There is always a way. The wind whines and howls with bitter breath through fangs of ice. Lightning snarls and barks upon the plain of glittering stone. Rage is a red, near-animate force, as bloated with compassion as a starving serpent. Few shadows frisk among the steely. Many have been summoned, there or yon. At its heart, the plain is disfigured by the scars of cataclysm. The jagged lightning bolt of a fissure has ripped across the face of the plain. Nowhere is that fissure so wide that a child couldn't step across, but it seems bottomless. Trailers of mist drift forth. Some bear a hint of color when they emerge. Cracks mar the surface of the great gray stronghold. A tower has collapsed across the fissure. From the fastness comes a deep, great, slow beat, like that of a grumbling world heart, disturbing the silence of stone. The wooden throne has shifted sideways. It has tilted a little. The figure nailed thereon has changed its sprawl. Its face is drawn in agony. Its eyelids flutter as though it is about to awaken. This is immortality of a sort, but the price is paid in silver of pain. And even time may have a stop. This has been an Audible Frontiers production. Executive Producer, Steve Feldberg. Producer, Mike Charzik. Music by Michael Whalen. Copyright 1997 by Glenn Cook. Audio recording copyright 2010 by Audible Inc. If you enjoyed this audiobook, the rest of Glenn Cook's Black Company series is available today. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.